Good morning, everyone. This is the December Wednesday, days. February 5th uh, Board of Commissioners meeting. Next said Board of Commissioners meeting is hereby called to order. I would ask if you would please join me in a few moments of silence. And now if you'll stand as you're able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. The first item on our agenda is the adoption of the agenda and a motion would be in order. Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. <coughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The next item on our agenda are uh, recognitions and we'll start with Chief Webster. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and thank you for giving us a few moments to introduce our newest police officer, Terrence Flogger, who joined the department in November of this past year and has already completed our field training officer program. Uh, Terrence also, uh, he likes to be referred to as Terry. Uh, he grew up in Pennsylvania and attended high school in Sharon, Pennsylvania, is that how you pronounce it? Terry enlisted in the Marine Corps at the age of 18 and attended boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina in the summer of 2009. Terry was assigned to 3rd Battalion, 6th Marine Regiment, where he served as a machine gunner and then later, when promoted to corporal, as a machine gun team leader. Terry served two tours in Afghanistan and left active duty service in 2013. His service awards include Combat Action Ribbon, a Presidential Unit Citation, a Navy Unit Commendation, the Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal, National Defense Medal, Afghanistan Campaign Medal, second, uh, two awards, Global War on Terror Terrorism Medal, Sea Service Deployment Ribbon, three awards, and the NATO ISAF Medal. After leaving the Marine Corps in 2013, Terry spent two years in the private sector. 2014, Terry attended, then later graduated from basic law enforcement training. He joined the Washington County Sheriff's Office in 2015. He served one year in Washington, then joined Terrell County Sheriff's Office in 2016. He worked for Terrell County Sheriff's Office for almost three years. He rose to the rank of sergeant and served as a patrol supervisor. In addition, he was coordinator of the Governor's Highway Safety Program and a field training officer. Terry is married to Catherine, has two children, a five-year-old son, Matthew, and a four-year-old daughter, Lily. And on his off-duty time, Terry likes to hunt, fish, spend time with his family, and he's also learning Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Wow. Terry, uh, just another example of the quality officer that we're attracting here in Nags Head. And I just want to say welcome aboard and thank you. Um, and next we'll have uh, Ralph come up to the podium. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. <clears throat> it's my uh, pleasure this morning to introduce you to uh, Nehemiah Cortez. Nehemiah is a new employee in our facilities maintenance uh, division. Uh, Nehemiah lives in Currituck with his, his three children. Um, he is a volunteer fireman for Lower Curry Tuck. And uh, also, Nehemiah comes with a, a, a little skill set that I, I haven't seen in 37 years. He was born in California. He was raised in Iowa on a dairy farm. So if we ever need uh, anybody to start milking cows, he's going to be our <laughs> man. <laughs> uh, in, in his spare time, Nehemiah loves to surf and bodyboard. Cool. Maya, welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. 
now Amy Miller. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. This is Brooke Norris. She is our new Deputy Finance Officer. Brooke comes to us with a lot of experience and was highly recommended by her previous employer, Duckwoods Country Club, although they were not happy that she left. <laughs> she has a well-rounded accounting background, making her highly qualified for this job, including running the family business and public accounting, where she also did governmental accounting and auditing. And she is really good at spreadsheets, which we are really going to take full advantage of. <laughs> we love spreadsheets. <laughs> um, I can tell she is very kind and fair in addition to being very knowledgeable and a hard worker. She's asking a lot of good questions, soaking everything in, completing a lot of tasks that have needed to get done with very little guidance. Um, she's doing a lot of self-teaching and figuring things out on her own based on her own curiosities. Um, Brooke is a very busy mom that loves to take care of and spend time with her family. And now we feel fortunate to have her in the town of Nagshead family where she can take care of us and the town's finances and hopefully spend a lot of time with us. So Brooke, welcome to the town. Thank you. Uh, Ralph to come back up again. Again, good morning. Uh, it's my honor this morning to present Keith White for his recognition for 25 years with the town. Keith started with the town in 1995 as a sanitation laborer. He moved up to equipment operator, and in 2011, he was promoted to uh, supervisor of the sanitation department. In the 25 years that Keith has been with the town and in public works, he has been the public works employee of the year three times. He was in employee of the year in 1998, 2005, and 2015. Um, Keith has a, a can-do attitude. That's what I can tell you. His, his, his saying is anytime I ask him about something, we got it. That's all he ever says is we got it. I, can we pick up the whole town for Christmas? We got it. <laughs> he never asks any other questions, but that's he always says, we got it. Um, you learn a lot about somebody when you work with him for 25 years, when you stand on the side of a trash truck 25 years ago in the rain and everything. Um, <laughs> and there's no more dedicated employee uh, that we have. I think uh, back in 2015, I had told you uh, a story when we, up in Elizabeth City, there was an ice and a snowstorm. Keith left there at 1 o'clock in the morning to get here so he could pick up the trash because he had called me and I said, no, we don't have any ice and snow. We, we're going to run. He said, okay, we got it. And uh, like I said, at 5 o'clock that morning, the trucks were rolling and we were picking up trash. So that's just the, the kind of person Keith is. And before I can say any more, Keith would like to address the board. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, okay. Well, I'd like to thank God this morning Get all on the first. So he's, he's the one that brought me through 25 years of, of town service this year, maybe a year rather, and uh, it was by his grace that we, um, I, I made it far. You all here today, you know, uh, I just thank God for that. And, um, and uh, I was telling around, I mean, I love, I love to go fishing and, and spend time with my family, my kids, and I got a lot of kids, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> grandkids. And uh, I was telling uh, Rick this morning, that I was telling Sue then this morning, I got another grandbaby on the way. So due in July, so I have like six grandkids and I got a one-year-old great-granddaughter. Wow. So uh, make me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> they get around, they call me Papa and all that, so I said, okay. So I thank God for that. Thank you. 
bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Mr. White, if you'll please wait a few minutes, um, we'll get a picture with him just, uh, just a little bit. Cliff, thank you. It's uh, an honor and pleasure, is an understatement, to be able to stand here next to our town clerk, Carolyn Morris. Um, I'm going to try to do justice to her, for her for 25 years of service, but it's that's an extremely hard thing to do, and. It's employees like Carolyn and Keith that, that make this town a great place. Um, they both are dedicated to their jobs um, and we're extremely fortunate to have them. Carolyn started her job with the town as deputy town clerk uh, and administrative assistant uh, in um, January of 1995. Quickly was promoted up to the town clerk, so Michelle, there's still hope for you back there. Um, <laughs> in July of 96, um, she, it, a lot of things have changed since Carolyn started. When I was going back and looking, she, um, she was very proud when she started of her stenography and transcription training, which I guess helped get the job here. And also her familiarity with Lotus and D-Base. And I don't know, that either, I don't know what D-Base is. Um, but um, she started out her career in, in federal government. She worked for Dare County Social Services for a short time. Uh, and we're very fortunate that she decided to come here and that, um, I guess at the time, Manager Fuller and Miss Hardy made that decision. Um, she's extremely consistent. Um, she, she knows her job very well, takes very little supervision, actually none at all. She can do her job. Um, she, can, she can find anything. She spends a lot of time um, finding things that I asked for and, I, and she finds them over the same thing over and over again and I figure if she can't find it, it probably doesn't exist. Um, it's not uncommon that she works nights and weekends. She works a lot of nights and weekends. She'll return emails at one, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Um, she, she, um, she has a very infectious laugh. It's one of the things I love most about Carolyn is her laugh. Um, it, it, it echoes in the whole West Wing of Town Hall and it just <laughs> it makes you feel good. Um, I appreciate her support and her patience. Uh, again, thank you is not enough for what she's done, not only for, for the town and for the board, but for me as well, and that I appreciate. Um, her husband Jim's here. Together they're the kind of the mayors of South Nags Head when Jerry McManus is in there. Uh, she looks out for South Nags Head, really cares about South Nags Head, and she cares about the trash and uh, stays on that part, and Keith, Keith knows about that. Um, she's got a uh, daughter, Eve. She has a granddaughter, uh, I mean a grandson, Wyatt, uh, and you can, uh, it's, immediately you can tell when Wyatt calls because that laugh and that, her, she's just so thrilled when she gets that phone call from him. Um, but again, I, Carolyn, Again, thank you is not enough. Um, we very much appreciate all that you've done, all that you continue to do, and for keeping us all straight. Thank you for your 25 years. I'd ask the board to come around. Are you going to address this also? No. Yeah, come on. Okay. So I'd ask the board, board to come around for a picture with Carolyn. Tell us a secret. Okay. Tell us a secret.
indeed blessed by some absolutely wonderful people in this town, and um, I know the board appreciates what they what they do for us and making us look good. Um, the next item on our agenda is the Jeanette's Peer Annual Update, and we'll have uh, the director come to the podium. Oh, just click. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mike Remage, and I don't know how I'm going to follow the dynamic duo that was just up here, but I'll do my best by giving you a recap of the last 12 months at Jeanette's Pier. Oh. All right, great. Um, I'm going to touch on uh, so, oh, excuse me, all the subjects that you see in front of you um, during the next few minutes. All right, during uh, 2019, um, we actually had an increase in visitation after a slight dip in 2018. Uh, the numbers you see in front of you are indicative of a 5% increase over the previous year, which is fantastic. Uh, interestingly enough, though, that increase has all occurred in the shoulder seasons. So April, May, September, October, November. Uh, for the past several years, our summer visitation, which is, of course, the highest of the year, has been relatively flat. So it's kind of nice to see that we're getting those visitors in the shoulder seasons to Jeanette's Pier. Probably the biggest operational change at the pier last year was uh, a major renovation to our pier shop, which is operated by the North Carolina Aquarium Society. What was once dark, cramped, uh, difficult to navigate is now bright, inviting, welcoming, and very easy to navigate. We've reorganized the entire uh, pier shop by taking the tackle and the snacks into one section and then uh, setting up a men's, women's, and children's section for clothing and souvenirs. We've also uh, spent a lot of time updating our inventory to meet the needs of our visitors. And overall, we have seen a 16% increase in gross sales, and that's considering that we were closed for the first two and a half months of the year. So that uh, we had that increase compared to a full year of business. So obviously money well spent. I'd also like to acknowledge that our peer shop has followed along with our goals of reducing our footprint and reducing single-use plastics. They now provide alternatives to single-use plastics. Um, and I think it's also indicative of the uh, message that we're sharing with our visitors that the number one selling item in our gift shop last year was reusable straws, glass and stainless steel reusable straws. Uh, we've also, we also embarked on several other large maintenance projects at the pier. Uh, we completely replaced all of the entrance lighting, uh, our pathway lights, which you see on the left, our bollards, which you see running up our ramp, and we took all of the old metal halide parking lot lights and uh, replaced them with LEDs. Um, Dominion Energy really appreciated that. Um, they actually gave us a, a nice rebate last year for doing all that work. Oops. Uh, we restriped our parking lot and we added some extra stormwater controls uh, right on the beach road to make sure that there was no overflow onto NC-12. We did a major overhaul of our entire fire suppression system by replacing 43 exterior sprinkler heads which had corroded. Uh, we also replaced the three main inline valves that supply the water to the pier for fire suppression, our two hot box valves and our post indicator valve. And I'd like to uh, thank Chief Wells and Station 21 crew for showing up that day as we shut everything down and restarted everything. They were a, a great help to us, so thank you very much. We also took an opportunity to rebrand our entrance, kind of give a little more information and inspiration to our guests as they come and leave. And we're very proud to continue in our efforts to uh, display very rare and rarely seen marine mammals at the pier, uh, following up on the installation of our Gervais beaked whale skeleton in 2018. We added a locally well-known bottlenose dolphin skeleton last year. Um, we also partnered with the Outer Banks Center for Dolphin Research, uh, who received a grant from the Community Foundation to add a digital display to that exhibit. And there's more to come. As most of you know, one of our main goals at the pier is to pro provide a platform for ocean research and ocean observing. With that in mind, we partnered with the Coastal Studies Institute on two research projects that started last year and are ongoing now. 
One will study the nearshore biofouling community or the organisms that quickly colonize any underwater structure. The other project will study the nearshore underwater acoustic environment to try and, and characterize that underwater soundscape. Both of these will set a baseline assessment for those two areas of interest. And what we're hoping is we can infer from those two research projects what the addition of marine renewable energy devices in our waters may either come up against or may alter in, that, in the uh, underwater environment. Uh, we've also been approached by a few outside researchers that are interested in testing their devices at the pier. The engineering department at Virginia Tech would like to deploy a point absorber wave energy converter prototype. We started conversations with them last fall. And of course, all of this is in partnership with the Coastal Studies Institute. Um, and we've also been approached by Triton Systems who would like to test their helical mooring design. And we're getting the public involved in research as well. Uh, Last year, the Army Corps of Engineers from Duck Pier approached me about uh, installing a citizen science project at the pier. So it's a very simple project, and anybody can get involved. Basically, there is a cell phone mount, which you can see in the photo there, that is uh, pointing at a fixed location on the beach north of Jeanette's Pier. Citizens can walk up, take a photo, upload those photos to a repository. Those uh, photos are being archived, time stamped and archived. And our goal one day is to maybe show a time-lapse series of what is happening to the beach north of Jeanette's Pier as we accrete in the summer and lose sand in the winter. So it should be a very interesting once we finally get enough data to show it to the public. Uh, looking at ocean research projects on a larger scale, Jeanette's Pier and the Coastal Studies Institute were very proud to be included in the 2015 Sandia National Lab's U.S. Wave Energy Converter Test Site Catalog as one of only two such sites on the east coast of the U.S. Honestly, when we were included in this catalog, we uh, fully expected people to come beating down our door with all these different <coughs> research projects saying, we want to work with you at Jeanette's Pier and the Coastal Studies Institute. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Apparently, this catalog is not as widespread uh, as L.L. Bean or uh, Eddie Bauer or any of those. So <laughs> it took a little while to build, build some momentum behind this. But um, last January, out of the blue, um, the Coast Studies Institute staff received kind of a cryptic inquiry from the Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office. They were asking about the Jeanette's Pier Wave Energy Test Facility, and they were requesting an immediate video conference presentation. So they gave us about a week to put something together, uh, demonstrating our assets and capabilities. And a week later, we got on the phone with them, and we uh, gave our presentation. It took about an hour. Um, the WPTO folks were full of questions for us. Um, we were full of questions for them. We answered all, all of their questions and they uh, actually declined to answer any of our questions. A lot of this was, I wouldn't say it was top secret, but they just didn't want to give up the ghost right away. So uh, we left that video conference sort of bewildered, um, kind of proud of ourselves, but a little bit bewildered about what was going on. Um, and then uh, literally a week or so later, we received an email that was inviting both representatives from the Coast Studies Institute and myself to participate in a planning workshop for a potential new federal prize competition that would spur innovation in wave energy power desalination systems. The goal was to fly to Colorado, join them in this workshop, and help develop this prize. Unfortunately, that was when the blizzard hit last year, and we never made it to Colorado, but they didn't give up on us. Soon after that, they announced the uh, Waves to Water Prize. And what is the Waves to Water Prize? It's a four-stage competition, with the final stage being a field test and demonstration in the ocean scheduled for spring 2021. The Department of Energy not only reached out to CSI and Jeanette's Pier because we have experience in deploying and testing devices in our waters already, but because they are considering us as the location for this final test. We've now been speaking with the Department of Energy for months. They have visited us on several occasions, and the feedback has been extremely positive. We know that we are in consideration as, one of the, fi as the final test location, along with a few other sites. Um, and if we are chosen, we won't just be in the spotlight, but the town of Nags will be in the spotlight as well. So please wish us luck in this. We should know something more in May of this year. All right, speaking of uh, competitions and other fun community events, uh, we're always honored to partner with you and the Visitors Bureau as the premier oceanfront venue, we believe, in the Outer Banks. 
Uh, the list in front of you is just a sample of some of the events coming in 2020, and most of these are annual events, events that are scheduled in and around and on the pier. Uh, we also believe that we are the premier facility rental venue in Nag Zed, Oceanfront, um, and as indicated by the numbers you see in front of you, um, honestly, I have to admit, 2019 was slightly down year. Um, I, I apologize, I should say 2019. 2019 was a slight down year for weddings, but that was across the wedding industry as a whole in the Outer Banks. Fortunately, we were able to make up some of that deficit by adding more corporate and uh, private rental events. So, Regardless, our clients still think we're the premier wedding venue in the Outer Banks, as indicated by uh, six years in a row of receiving these awards from these various client-based publications. All right, we also uh, are consistently recognized as one of the finest informal education facilities in Eastern North Carolina. Last year, our education department set new records for the number of field trips to the pier and the number of North Carolina school students attending, with nearly 10,000 North Carolina school students coming to the pier from 43 different counties. 103 of those field trips occurred last year between March and May. So our education department rarely sleeps during that time. Um, and then they have to make it through an entire summer of summer camps after that. But they're very happy to do it. Um, for schools who may not be able to afford an outreach program or an educational trip to the pier, we work with our partners at the North Carolina Aquarium Society, the North Carolina Public School System, private and private donors to provide aquarium scholars mini grants to make sure that those schools aren't left out. Last year in 2019, we provided the funds to educate more than 2,000 of the 10,000 North Carolina school students through these mini grants with five outreach programs and 11 field trips. And as I indicated in the summer, we switch gears and uh, dive right into summer camps. Fortunately, um, we have been able to provide scholarship funds Thanks to the family of Lily Roderick, who hosts the Outer Banks Taco Cook-Off, every year for the past several years to our summer camps. Um, you can see the numbers in front of you. I believe it was 59 scholarships to summer camps last year. And new for the 2019 calendar was the addition of our exceptional day camps for special needs children from the area, which was created by seasonal educator Kim, Mc Mc uh, Kim McGee, who is in the green shirt on the far right. Um, thanks to all the hard work from the education team, Jeanette's Pier was just chosen as the Dare County Friends of Youth Sponsor of the Year this year. And in 2020, we have plans to offer 70 camp scholarships to children in need. Uh, pier staff are still heavily involved as first responders for the Outer Banks Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Um, we cover the area from Duck through South Nags Head, although if they need us anywhere, we're willing to jump in and help. Last year, we responded to 25 calls, and uh, staff gave over 100 hours of service to the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Uh, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the town here. We've also uh, stepped up our outreach efforts around Marine Mammal Stranding response. And um, the, the town was very willing to support our efforts by uh, posting seven Marine Mammal Stranding signs, which you see at the bottom of the picture, at seven key beach accesses in the town. So thank you very much for that. We also participate in the aquarium division-wide sand tiger shark tagging, tag tracking um, research that we're doing. There actually is, what you see right there is a Vemco receiver. It's an acoustic tag receiver that is strapped to one of the pier pilings. Every time a tagged fish swims by that, it records that data. And then there's a, a database of all the different fish uh, that, um, that are being recorded with all the Vemco receivers up and down the east coast of the US. Um, we're mainly concerned with the sand tiger sharks. And as you can see, uh, there were three adult females from Moorhead that had been tagged in Moorhead City and one adult male that had been tagged in Delaware Bay that swam by and uh, pinged our receiver this year, as well as numerous other species. The ones in yellow are the only ones that we got hits from. I'd also like to report that we are still members of the Responsible Peer Initiative in which we uh, care for uh, animal uh, sea turtles that have interactions with uh, anglers at the pier. Fortunately, last year was the first year in our history where we did not have a single sea turtle interaction with an angler. So hopefully our education uh, efforts are working there. Uh, update on one of the sustainability projects that I introduced to you last year. 
We did deploy 43 different cigarette butt receptacles around the entire property um, with the idea that we would collect those cigarette butts and not dispose of them, but turn them over to TerraCycle so they could be recycled into industrial products. Um, we collected eight and a half pounds of cigarette butts last year, which doesn't sound like much until you consider that eight and a half pounds of cigarette butts is actually almost 25,000 cigarette butts that did not either enter the waste stream or end up as litter on the beaches. So uh, we would love to expand this effort and we're willing to work with the town in any way we can to do so. Uh, there were some big changes, which I sort of alluded to when I was with you last year within the aquariums and the aquarium society. We uh, saw the retirement of our long serving division director, David Griffin, as well as the long serving president of the aquarium society, Neil Conley, which caused a whole bunch of shuffling and shifting within the, uh, the hierarchy of the aquarium division and the aquarium society. So I'd like to highlight a few of those. Many of you know Malin White, who was the former director of the Roanoke Island Aquarium. He is center left on the screen up there. He is now our new division director. Um, Jay Barnes, lower right-hand corner, who was former development director with the Aquarium Society, has now stepped into the role of president of the Aquarium Society. And as those two were elevated to these new positions, we had to do some shuffling and find some new folks to fill those gaps. So in the upper left corner, you see Larry Warner, who was former exhibits curator at the Roanoke Island Aquarium, left the state and went to Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut for several years and returned triumphantly to take over at the Roanoke Island Aquarium. Top center is Liz Baird, who just recently left the uh, Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh to join the aquarium team by heading the Pine Mill Shores Aquarium. Uh, top right is Jim Mulvey. He took the, over as development director of the Aquarium Society. Bottom left is my new business manager, who replaced Karen Pinion, who retired last August. And that is Lorelei Zumbrunnen, and she's very dynamic. I hope you all have a chance to meet her someday. I'd also like to mention a few changes on the board. Five members from the Aquarium Society board have been moved to emeritus, including our own Ray White. And we've added six new members to the Aquarium Society board, including three from this region, one who is in the room, or two who are in the room with us right now, Ronnie Sloan and Tess Judge, uh, as well as Clark Twitty. I'd also like to highlight a new partnership with the Outer Banks Hospital. Um, they uh, are providing support for education efforts at both the North Carolina Aquarium and at Jeanette's Pier, and we're very honored that they've chosen us as partners in this en endeavor. Uh, a low light, we did have Hurricane Dorian come through. Obviously, we were not nearly as impacted as our friends to the south, but Jeanette's Pier did sustain some damage um, to our roofs and to all of our wind turbines. We've been working with the Department of Insurance to rectify these problems. FEMA just visited a couple weeks ago, so we're moving forward with uh, working on fixing all the problems out there at Jeanette's Pier from Hurricane Dorian. Oh, by the way, peak wind gust for anybody that didn't get to see it, 98 miles an hour at the pier. So that's our on-site anemometer. Uh, just a few things we're looking forward to this year, a few uh, exhibit redesigns. We are working with North Carolina Sea Grant, their fishery specialist, to install a, an interactive fishery science exhibit at the pier. We are going to be saying goodbye to Sailor Jerry. That is our Gervais Beak whale skeleton that has been on loan for the past two years from the Maritime Museum in Beaufort. And we will be welcoming in a mother and calf pygmy sperm whale pair, uh, rearticulated skeletons, just like their Gervais Beak uh, whale you see there. As far as we know, we will be the only facility in North America displaying a mother and calf pygmy sperm whale on site. And then off to the right, you see um, all of our static graphic panels at the pier. We are coming up on our 10 year anniversary in about a year and a half, and we have already started the process of revising and revitalizing all of those exhibits. And that's it. I thank you for your time. And um, I, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I have one question. Yes. The board may have questions. Um, I was glad to hear that you were able to supplement the wedding business with the corporate events. Can you generally characterize those? Are they single day or how large are the groups and where are they coming from? Um, they run the gamut. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had single day events. We have uh, several insurance uh, events coming up this spring. Um, we've had multi-day events, uh, as Renee knows, from the, um, uh, the CRC has met at Jeanette's Pier in the past. Um, I'd, I'd actually have to get some numbers from my rental coordinator to kind of characterize those a little better, but they, they run the gamut from half-day events to three-day events, um, and they're coming from all over the state. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Yes. Board? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is public comment, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Leidy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Every month, the Board of, of Commissioners uh, receives comments from members of the public. This is the public's opportunity to comment on matters of interest to them and to share this with the board. It's not an opportunity for dialogue, and the board rarely responds to public comment, but uh, anybody who wishes to provide comments on anything uh, should do so at this time. Uh, I will also point out that we have a public hearing scheduled uh, a little bit later this morning uh, for a um, site plan um, consideration for the Outer Banks Hospital. If you wish to comment on that, you should reserve your comments until we get to that public hearing. But if you want to comment on anything else, if you will please uh, approach the podium, uh, start by telling us who you are and where you live, um, and then uh, address your comments to the board as a whole. Also, I will be keeping the time. Everyone uh, has a five minute limit, and I'll let you know when your time is up. So. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susie Walters. I live at 415 Raceview Court in Nags Head. Um, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I know you're wrestling with the fact that our recyclables are now being incinerated in Portsmouth to be utilized by the Navy for energy. While not the conventional recycling anticipated, it is nonetheless recycling or reuse. The contract states no more than 10% of the recyclables can be incinerated or placed in a landfill. Yet some of you are considering placing this waste in our landfill until the summer season when recycling is greater due to our visitors. I know some of you are concerned about reducing our carbon footprint and suggest ceasing recycling during the off season and only providing one day of trash service for all. The savings is approximately $6,700 in fuel over three months. However, other vehicles will be utilized during the day. There are many ways to reduce our carbon footprint the town could invest in electric vehicles, except for those that are required for public safety. They could place solar plan panels on our town hall and other buildings. They could continue to reduce the need for paper and plastic within the town. I know baby steps have been taken in this direction. I applaud your commitment to our environment, and I'm hopeful the sustainability plan you're working on will include even more options. You may be considering a return to individual <coughs> payment for recycling service. However, recycling is already included in this year's budget, so our citizens have already paid for recycling through June 30th of this year. The town has invested in 7,213 recycling carts at a cost of $240,165, which is approximately one penny of tax, for the 4,570 residential properties within the town. This does not include the labor to number and deliver each can, nor does it include all the educational materials distributed over the past five years. Additionally, it costs $70 per ton to recycle and $77 per ton to take the materials to the landfill. And the distance from public works to the transfer station in Powell's Point is 16 miles versus the 22 miles to the landfill. The town has the manpower and the equipment to continue recycling in the off season. The Board of Commissioners has changed the trash and recycling schedule each year for the past five years. This creates chaos for staff who must change all schedules and relabel each can, and it creates chaos for our citizens and our property management companies. It also requires new educational information for the public. The North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality has stated you can continue to recycle under the current scenario until they rule on this matter in April. They are also working for solutions for Northeastern North Carolina. You were notified in January of this year about the change in process for recyclables. Therefore, I encourage you to, to modify the current contract to allow for incineration, continue to gather more information so you can make an informed decision and wait for a ruling from the DEQ before determining the fate of recycling for our citizens. I thank you for your time and your consideration and I ask that my comments be included in their entirety in the minutes with your permission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walters. All right. All right, next. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, Mr. Manager. Thank you for letting me speak, and I won't take five minutes. Uh, kind of a personal plea in a way. For the last 
approximately 10 years, I've participated in the Special Olympics polar bear plunge. During that time, I've raised about $11,000 for Special Olympics. I'll be doing it again this weekend in Virginia Beach. Which brings me to my point. The closest polar bear plunge that we have in this region is in Virginia Beach. So I simply wanted to propose the possibility of looking into bringing that event here as well. Uh, two things that I see as positives from that. Number one, obviously we raised some local funds for Special Olympics. But number two, uh, to help our commerce in the off season, bringing generally thousands of people come in for these kinds of events. So that's my proposal. Thank you for your time. Sir, and, I'm sorry, could you uh, give us your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Al Friedman. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sherry Payne, and I live at 407 Race View Court in Nags Head. And um, first, I'd like to thank the Nags Head Board of Commissioners for allowing me to speak today. I'd like to thank each of you for your time and energy that you have put into making Nags Head a great place to live. I owned and operated a homeowners association management business for 30 years in, the, in this town. So I can tell you, I understand how difficult it is to make everyone happy and to still stay in budget. I can also relate to meetings where people like myself are permitted to speak and voice opinions on a subject where we may not have all the pertinent information. That being said, I'm going to leave some of the facts and figures to some of the others. I'd like to express my feelings on the recycling issue from my own perspective. Nags Head is truly a special place. Although the ocean certainly helps, the beauty of the town has not happened by accident. It has been shaped by the continuing generous hard work of our Board of Commissioners and many other hardworking individuals. I, for one, like what you've been doing. I love the beach nourishment, pro beach nourishment program, the sidewalks, the bike path, the blossoming event center. I'm thrilled with the adopt a beach and the highway programs, as well as the citizens watch program. I support the stricter architectural standards that make this town special. It makes me so happy to see all the children and the family spending their time at Dowdy Park. There's always kids laughing and playing. There's music, yoga, farmer's market, and on and on. These are all things that make Nags Head a community. It is apparent everywhere you look. I am proud to have raised a beautiful daughter in the local schools and programs. I know most of the people in this room have children and families. We all have spent years teaching our children how to be good people and to live and work in a responsible manner. We have taught our children to be respectful of others and to make this world a better place. Better place. <clears throat> the recycling program is just a small part of what we've been teaching our children. This is respect for our planet. I realize there are budgetary and possible contract issues with the cost of recycling. And aside from the absolute nightmare I foresee in stopping and starting a program like this, I just do not see how you can go back. Do, you tell, do we tell our children that recycling no longer matters because of the few dollars it will cost us? Do we tell our children that we've taught them what we've taught them is meaningless? Do we tell them that thinking globally is something other, some other town should deal with? Do we continue to send recyclables to the landfill and let the next generation figure it out? I strongly urge you to consider the wider ramifications of your decision. I thank you for your time, and I hope you continue the recycling program and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Is there anybody else who wishes to address the board? If so, this is your chance. If not, at this time, we will conclude the public comment session. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there one more person? I'm <laughs> <laughs> morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning, commissioners, mayor, manager. 
My name is Dave Masters, Jr. I reside at 209 West Dolphin Court in Old Nags Head Coat. I'm up here concerning the possibility of rescinding the rollback to the trash carts. <coughs> I understand there's a lot of issues with this topic. Um, I know that we, the town pays for pulling the trash carts back on the beach road. Um, I saw in your retreat that the HOAs were to be notified for the Village of Nagshead and the Old Nagshead Cove Association, which I'm the treasurer at the Old Nagshead Cove Association. Um, our manager was out of town on the 22nd of January and just returned, so she didn't get an email. Maybe she did. I haven't heard. So we weren't notified that I know of. I'm sure we did get the email. However, why are we rescinding something that we adopted? Because we can't enforce it? Is it not applicable anymore? What is the reasoning behind that? I do understand enforcement is difficult, but just to rescind it because we can't enforce it, I think is taking you know, the easy way out. I would urge the commissioners to take another look at this issue and maybe come up with another resolution versus striking it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masters. All right, is there anyone else who wishes to address the board? If not, we will conclude the public comment session now. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Leidy. The next item on our agenda is the consent agenda, and I believe an action is uh, anticipated. Webb? Um, with the board's permission, I'd like to um, remove item 8 until the mid-month meeting until I can get some clarification concerning some process issues as well as some substantive issues. Thank you. A motion? Uh, a motion. That, that is second. a motion. Is, I have a motion and a second. Um, that would be to approve the consent agenda with the removal of item eight to the mid-month meeting. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing, and I will turn it back to Mr. Lighty again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this time, we will begin the public hearing to consider a vested right site plan for the Adamanks Hospital um, submitted by Quibble and Associates on behalf of the hospital. Uh, this application involves the demolition of the urgent care facility and construction of a 10,400 square foot addition uh, to the existing radiology therapy building. On this type of matter, the board sits as a quasi-judicial body in considering it, and whenever the board does that, there are certain rules and requirements uh, that apply. First, the board's decision must be based on competent material and substantial evidence in view of the record as a whole. Those who are presenting evidence must be sworn in or affirmed by the town clerk. Uh, the board's decision must be based only on evidence that is presented during the hearing. Uh, in addition, um, when the board sits as a quasi-judicial panel to decide this type of application, it is imperative that no member participate in or vote on the matter in a manner that would violate someone's uh, constitutional rights to an impartial decision maker. Impermissible violations of due process include, but are not limited to, having a fixed opinion prior to the hearing uh, that is not susceptible to change undisclosed ex parte communications about the matter, uh, and having a close familial, business, or other associational relationship with an affected person or a financial interest in the outcome of the matter. Previously undisclosed ex parte communications <laughs> which have not caused you to develop a fixed opinion may be cured through disclosure of the facts that, uh, or information that have been obtained uh, on the record. A party or a member of council, including the council member at issue, may object to any member's participation for lack of impartiality. If an objection is raised to a member's participation and that member does not choose to recuse themselves, the remaining members shall, by majority vote, rule on the objection. So at this time, I ask whether any of you have any conflicts that would potentially keep you from being an impartial decision maker or have you received any undisclosed communications or information which you need to disclose at this time? No. All right, 
Let me briefly go over the procedures that will apply to this. First, the applicant has the right to question any witness and to offer rebuttal uh, evidence. Board members may question any witness at any time, and if you have any questions, just let me know and I'll be glad to uh, recognize you and allow you to ask those questions. If the, board mem uh, if the board has questions for any witness, those need to be asked during the public hearing. So uh, let's make sure that we get those in on the record. Uh, as we begin, I'm going to ask that all of those um, who are going to be uh, submitting evidence uh, regarding this application, whether for or uh, in opposition to it, if you will please uh, <clears throat> approach the town clerk so that she may administer the oath or affirmation. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Thank you, everyone. All right, at this time, we'll begin the evidentiary presentation um, with the uh, presentation of staff's analysis by the uh, Deputy Planning Director, um, Kelly Wyatt. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, as you said, the applicant um, for this request is Clive Willen Associates on behalf of the Outer Banks Hospital. What they're seeking is a vested right, conditional use, site plan approval. Um, for uh, various moving parts. So I apologize if I repeat myself as we go through this, but um, the scope of work that's to be considered today is the demolition of the existing 3,000 square foot urgent care building at 4923 South Croatan Highway. Um, I have a uh, aerial with some zoning overlay on it um, to just kind of give an idea of the location of this, um, but this is the, um, the current urgent care facility that we're talking about. Um, this is the new radiation facility that was recently constructed. Um, so again, the proposal would be to demolish this existing urgent care facility and to construct a 10,400 square foot addition to the existing radiation facility um, located at 4927 South Croatan Highway. And this would house an infusion center, um, an outpatient cancer center, and, uh, and then these three lots behind would be utilized for parking, stormwater management, landscaping, and other infrastructure to support the center. Um, the applicant has requested consideration to be given to a conditional use request to allow a reduced loading berth um, based upon the anticipated deliveries to the facility, which would be via a cargo van. Um, the applicant has noted that medical supplies and linens will be the primary delivery to the location, um, and that would not require the specified loading zone that we have outlined in the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, what the ordinance requires is a 12 by 60 loading zone. Um, what they would like to have that reduced to is a 20 by 23 loading zone which will be shown on the site plan as we move through. Um, the applicant has requested that consideration be given to a reduction in the required parking based upon the medical office use as is allowed by a conditional use permit under the UDO. Um, the proposed use of an infusion center or outpatient cancer center is uh, unique. We don't currently have that listed as uh, a proposed use um, or with a proposed parking standard within our town code. Um, so they've provided some information in your package about that requested reduction. Um, in addition to the site plan application, they're requesting a rezoning of three lots along South Passageway. Um, and that is what uh, this image uh, represents. So we have South Passageway here. And these are the three lots. Um, that they are requesting the rezoning. So currently, uh, this whole area was zoned SPDC, um, Special Plan Development District, and this whole area was zoned Hotel District. 
But in 2009, the board heard and approved a rezoning request to rezone the blue area from hotel district to SF4, or SF2, I apologize, um, single family detached district in order to develop this as the Moongate subdivision. Um, so medical use um, is not a <coughs> listed use that is allowed within the SF2 residential zoning district. So what's being requested is that this board consider rezoning these three lots um, back into the hotel district where medical facilities are a permissible use. Um, as we've noted, um, there are several properties being taken into consideration for this. Um, essentially, we have five properties. Um, it would consist of uh, the rezoning of these properties, but in terms of our comprehensive plan, these two properties are located um, within the general commercial um, land use area as well as the general commercial activity node. So as far as the land use plan or the comprehensive plan is concerned, medical facility is a um, acceptable use within this district. For these three properties where the rezoning is requested, um, the comprehensive plan, the future land use map, classifies these properties as planned unit development, but it also has these properties within the village municipal service character area. And within that area, we list hospital and medical care facilities as an appropriate and desirable use within the character area. So in your staff report, we've provided um, the relevant policies for your consideration. The staff does find that the expansion of medical facilities to include this proposed cancer facility, as well as the rezoning associated with the request is consistent with the uh, land use classification and the land use policies included in your package. Um, I would note that as we move forward, it might be more beneficial for the board to consider taking the rezoning request first um, as the, um, uh, the use itself would not be permitted uh, in the SF2 district. So if the rezoning is not first approved, um, the secondary request would not be necessary. Moving through just some pieces of the UDO in terms of lot coverage, um, if the rezoning is approved, these five lots would be combined into one, so we would look at lot coverage holistically at that point. Um, as far as the maximum allowable building coverage, um, parking lot area coverage, landscaped area, and area for interior landscaping, um, we do find that they are compliant in all of those areas. I'm going to try to scroll down um, to locate the site plan that would best indicate what we're speaking of at this point. this for now. Um, so again, you can see uh, the lot coverage areas here. Um, this would be the parking area um, and then the primary facility here. And then here's additional parking area with um, some stormwater facilities in the back. Um, in terms of height, we allow uh, maximum height within the town to be 35 feet. The, you can go higher than that with a 42 pitch. If you have an A12 uh, roof pitch, they are coming in at an overall height of 33.3 feet, um, which we'll, we'll see in the architectural drawing shortly. So height would be compliant. Um, let me go ahead and scoot to the architectural. 
Um, the UDO does require, <coughs> the, new, the new UDO now requires that um, 150 architectural design points be achieved, whereas prior to that it was 125. Um, so in review of this, there's um, several elevations that we can scroll through, but they do meet the 150 architectural design points through the use of uh, first floor porch, dormers, um, as I stated, the 812 roof pitch, uh, combination base form, and simulated wood shingle siding, uh, single hung windows, and some other miscellaneous details. Um, I do have in your package to note that when the radiation therapy building was constructed, um, that structure only had to meet 125 architectural design points. Um, so uh, they did have to up those design points for this new construction. Next, uh, I want to talk about parking, and I know we touched on that a little bit. Um, go back up to the site plan as we discuss this. Um, as I said, when we looked at the use, this most similarly um, met the medical facility standard within our code. So when we applied that medical office use um, to the proposed facility, that was going to result in the need for approximately 72 parking spaces. So that's taking into consideration the parking that is already present for the <coughs> radiation therapy structure. Um, and then they would have to provide an additional 50. So um, in discussions with them, it was going to be 70, required 72 parking spaces. So as noted, they have requested a reduction in the parking standard. And um, to do that, they have provided an article that's included in your package from the ITE, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, a, transport, a parking generation <laughs> manual where they have actually evaluated um, the, the best parking for a facility which is more similar to what they are requesting, an outpatient cancer facility. Um, the ITE manual states that for an outpatient cancer center, it would support a rate of 3.5 to 4.5 spaces per 1,000 square feet of floor area. If you were, were to apply that standard, um, it would require between 52 and 67 parking spaces and the applicant has proposed 57 parking spaces. Um, so it would fall within that, that suggested parking from the ITE um, for an outpatient cancer center. Specifically, the applicant is seeking a reduction of one parking space via the use of a bike rack pursuant to section 10.15.5 and then requesting an additional 14 parking space reduction under section 10.15.6 justified by the number of employees, the number of patient treatment rooms available, the waiting room capacity, and the availability of Dare County Transit Services for many of the patients who will be coming to this facility. Um, the requested reduction, a total of 57 on-site parking spaces, uh, would be consistent with the, IT, the ITE manual. Staff does recommend approval of the requested parking reduction However, we would suggest that um, after receipt of the CO that there be a parking analysis at the six month period as well as the 12 month period to ensure that there's adequate parking available. Um, and I would note that should at that time there not be adequate parking available, uh, there is an opportunity to provide 11 to 12 additional more parking spaces if necessary. Um, Town code requires that 20% of the parking area be in a permeable um, material, and they have provided in excess of 20% to be in, per in a permeable material. Um, and again, um, I would just note the request of a reduced um, loading zone berth at this time as we're looking at the parking. In terms of buffering and landscaping, um, section 9.2.4.10, of the UDO requires that a 20 foot wide landscape buffer be provided um, along this east side adjacent to residential. Um, I don't want to take a long time to try to find this site plan, but um, 
they have included a landscape plan where this 20-foot buffer, um, this compliant 20-foot wide buffer is shown um, in compliance with the code. There we go. So as you can see, they do have their um, required vegetation plantings along this boundary here. Um, we also have a requirement that where off-street parking is adjacent to a right-of-way, uh, we need a 10-foot wide vegetated buffer. Um, as you can see, this is an existing buffer um, where the radiation therapy structure currently is. Um, that 10-foot wide buffer would just be extended um, through this area as these parking spaces are adjacent to the 158 right-of-way. Um, we do require that a percentage of the interior parking area be provided in landscaping. Um, when we do the calculations for that, um, a little over a thousand square feet of landscape area needs to be within the parking designated within the parking area. Um, they have almost 1,500 square feet, so they do meet that requirement. Um, we also have a requirement that you can either preserve 10% of existing on-site mature vegetation um, or plant 15%, and um, they have shown that their intention is to preserve um, approximately 11.5% of the existing on-site vegetation so we do find that they're in compliance with that requirement. They have presented a lighting plan to us. Staff has reviewed and approved that, but of course a light audit will be um, required. Um, no additional signage has been proposed at this time. Uh, you do have a letter from Carolina Water stating um, that they are um, committed to serving this um, proposed structure should it be approved. Um, as far as traffic circulation goes, the applicant has provided um, refuse collection and fire vehicle padding um, exhibits, and um, those have been reviewed. Um, fire has reviewed that and will touch on a concern by um, the refuse collection as we move through the staff report. Um, stormwater management, uh, they have provided that plan. The town engineer has reviewed the stormwater management plan. He does find it to be consistent with um, the requirements of the code. And we've noted that an NCDEQ high density stormwater management permit will need to be acquired and um, submitted to the town along with an operation and maintenance agreement. Um, that is in a memorandum from the town engineer, which is included in your package dated December 13th, 2019. As noted, uh, the fire department has reviewed and approved the proposal, um, and as always, must comply with fire prevention code. Um, just to go back here, so our public works director has reviewed this proposal. As you can see, they have uh, their proposed dumpster located in this area. And during the uh, technical review meeting, our public works director, Ralph Burrill, did note um, that he generally had some concern um, with the refuse truck being able to pull in, front load, um, and back out. Um, but the applicant has gone ahead and had a conversation with the carrier who takes care of um, trash pickup at Outer Banks Hospital, and they have noted that if they do need to service this facility, they can do that, should there be an issue with the town's um, pickup service here. Um, so just a quick analysis of the rezoning request and the uh, vested right site plan application. Um, staff does support the request to rezone those three lots along passageway. Again, um, it was previously SPDC hotel. It would just be reverting back to that original zoning. And we do find that the um, land use plan, uh, those policies do support that rezoning. Um, with the uh, vested right site plan application, staff finds that the proposal is consistent with the use standards and the development standards, um, as well as the land use policies. 
As with any conditional use, there are four findings that the board must make. We have outlined those in your staff report for your consideration. Um, and taking into consideration any conditional use, which would result in a parking reduction, there are five findings that must be made, and those have been spelled out in the staff report as well. Um, staff notes that through the use of the ITE manual, how they have justified um, the parking reduction, as well as the fact that staff will monitor parking and request that parking analysis be done um, at six months and at one year. Um, we do feel like the parking reduction um, has been, um, those findings, the, the five findings have and will be satisfied. Um, at their December 17th meeting, the planning board voted unanimously to recommend approval of both the rezoning and the vested right conditional use site plan application. Um, we did note in your um, report that this project did go through the sketch plan phase with the planning board and at that time they had three potential options um, for how this would be constructed and the planning board unanimously, unanimously selected um, this option as um, they did feel like it was going to provide adequate parking but they had also gone ahead and provided a mechanism to provide additional parking should it be necessary. Um, and again, staff's recommendation is both for approval of the rezoning request as well as the site plan. <coughs> Happy to answer any questions. Uh, we do have Kathleen Saunders with Quibble available as well as um, several representatives from the Outer Banks Hospital. <coughs> All right, <clears throat> do members of the board have any questions for Ms. Wyatt? Um, first of all, I think you made a great presentation um, and whittled my five questions to one and a half. <laughs> um, the half question is, this is a rezoning from a commercial use to a commercial use. It's not a rezoning from a residential use to a commercial use. Is that correct? So, Currently, the three lots that are being considered for the rezoning are zoned residential. Okay, I thought you said it was zoned hotel. So, uh, it might be easier if I can pull this up. Um, visuals always help. Um, I apologize. I, there's been some history on this lot, so um, it might have been a little confusing, but originally um, this whole, prior to 2009, this whole area was zoned SPDC hotel. But in 2009, um, the developer interested in creating Moongate subdivision asked for a rezoning of this particular area from hotel to um, single family two, a detached single family zoning district. So that rezoning was approved. So at that time, this became a residential zoning. Um, okay. And what's before you today is to kind of revert back to what it originally was just for these three lots. So do we have, then I'll ask my original question. Okay. Do we have anything in our land use plan or any other policy statements that talks about the transition of removing residential zones and making them commercial? We don't have that included in your package. I, I know it's not I, in the I'm package. happy to take a moment and, and review our plan. I don't have the answer for you right now, but I, I, I can do that. So, Michael, I just noted um, that, Michael, I might need you to get sworn in, um, <laughs> that there is no policy um, that would preclude, to Michael's knowledge, there's no policy that would preclude converting residential to commercial. Okay. We, I know we used to have that, so that's no longer in existence. 
again, I know we used to have that as well, um, and I'm assuming it is no longer in there. Let's have uh, Mr. Zener sworn in so that he can provide some evidence on that question. So I think uh, Ms. Wyatt indicated earlier that this general area or the policies for this general area would not preclude this rezoning request. And we're not aware of any policies in the, in the current comprehensive plan that would preclude uh, rezoning or reverting from a residential zoning district to a more commercial district. I'm not aware of any direct policies that would preclude that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, and then the, that's, that's great. Um, the next question is, is this proposed structure subject to the Village Architectural Control Committee review, and if so, has that happened? Yes, um, it but is subject to that, and yes, it has occurred, and um, once the applicant speaks, I think they can provide more information about that, but not only has um, the Village Architectural Control Committee reviewed the structure, um, but I believe Ms. Montgomery has been in communication with many of the um, property owners, residential property owners as well, to just get their input. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions for Ms. Wyatt? Anybody else? Does the applicant have any questions for Ms. Wyatt or Mr. Zener, for that matter? All right. All right. Thank you very much, thank you. Kelly. All right. At this time, the applicant may produce, or I'm sorry, may introduce evidence regarding this application. <coughs> if you'll please approach the podium and present your evidence. I believe all three of y'all were sworn in. Is that correct? Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Cahoon and Commissioners. I'm Amy Montgomery, Senior Administrator of Operations at the Outer Banks Hospital. As hospitals are designated, the Outer Banks Hospital, by technical description, is considered a critical access hospital. The definition of that being hospitals that have 25 beds or less. Um, so I want to just talk about the quality of our cancer program based on that designation. There are over more than 1,300 critical access hospitals in the United States. The Outer Banks Hospital Cancer Program is one of 14 of those more than 1,300 critical access hospitals in the country that has a cancer program that is accredited by the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer. So that accreditation is a gold seal of approval of the quality of the cancer program that we have here in this community. Um, and in the words of your team member, Keith White, if uh, someone on the Outer Banks has cancer, we got gotcha. you. We've got gotcha. you. Um, so I just want you to know a little bit about the quality of our program. Um, so everything has room for improvement. And current state in our cancer program is that our cancer patients who seek care through us uh, currently have to seek that care in different locations. And as you might imagine, um, as you have had family members who've suffered cancer, or maybe yourselves, um, to have cancer and to have to seek treatment in three physical different locations adds a burden to cancer care in our community. Um, for example, our medical oncology practice is on the second floor of our medical office building at the hospital. Um, patients receive chemotherapy on the first floor in the hospital, quite a distance to walk for patients um, or be wheelchaired as well as our radiation therapy center is across the street and many patients receive care at all three locations. So that's current state and we have a clear vision of our future state and our future state is that all of our cancer services are located under one roof so that we can continue to provide high quality coordinated comprehensive cancer care in a manner that is more compassionate for our patients so that they do not have to ambulate uh, to many different locations to receive their care. Um, I have, uh, as Kelly noted, um, made contact with many of the um, adjacent property owners um, who live in the, uh, pa on Passageway. Uh, the four property owners that I spoke with were supportive of the cancer program um, that we, they're supportive of our vision 
Um, some minor concerns that were shared with me, uh, one uh, that came up quite often was, uh, would there be more traffic on passageway? Um, and the answer that I have given all of those property owners was, um, I don't believe that the traffic will be any different than it is now. Patients uh, will still come in to the cancer center as they do the urgent care center. There's currently a medical facility there and also leave uh, either through the uh, bypass or there is an egress on the beach road. Um, that was the most common concern that I received. Um, the other concern that um, I've had and that you may be wondering as well is urgent care going away. <laughs> uh, most people wanted to know and most people do want to know, do we, uh, continue, will we continue to maintain an urgent care center? And the answer is yes, we're actively pursuing um, uh, other locations within the town of Nags Head to relocate that urgent care center. People don't want that to go away. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. All right, does the board have any questions for Ms. Montgomery? Ms. Cahoon. I don't know if my question's for you, Amy. Good morning, by the way. Good morning, Renee. Um, the look of the hospital is not being transitioned. It doesn't appear to be to this new center with the shuttering of the building and stuff. Is there, was there a reason why it was consciously not pursued to link the architecture of the hospital to this facility? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I. I would. <laughs> yes, Craig. <laughs> Craig Leonard, our architect, can answer that question. Hi, I am Craig Leonard uh, with the East Group, the architect for the project. Um, actually, we do have a lot of architectural elements that are in common with the hospital. Uh, the What we refer to as the Bahama shutters. They are on the, all of the dormers that would be on the new facility. They're not on the lower windows. Uh, the reason being light into, that, into those rooms and the views out uh, for, for instance, people getting infusions or waiting for family members. Those kind of views are very important to the, to, to the wellness of the patient. So <coughs> where it would not impede uh, that, that, that atmosphere, we did, we did apply the shutters. Uh, everywhere else, we, we're keeping the windows open. Uh, there is another building on the uh, hospital property. It is the, the rehabilitation building. And uh, if you look at that building and the radiation therapy building, the detailing on those are very, very similar. So there is a tie across the street. And the new addition will be uh, basically the same elements, uh, just made a little bigger so that we can fit all of the, uh, all the functions into the building. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Montgomery or for the architect? Ms. Montgomery, when, when you spoke to the <coughs> residents in Moongate, have you followed up with the residents in Moongate about their concerns with the traffic uh, since moving forward in the process or the original conversation? Not since the original conversations, no. Um, we did also, to confirm what Kelly shared, uh, I did present to um, the Village of Nags Head Architectural Review Committee, and they did approve our plans. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many employees total will be there day to day? At approximately 23. And that, that rear parking lot that's facing the uh, subdivision, is that going to be considered employee parking or would that be? We uh, generally parking? request our employees to park the farthest from the door to the facility. So um, once we get in the facility, we will <coughs> request that employees or team members park farthest from the doors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I just have one question. Okay. Yes, sir. The radiation center, that currently nice looking building. I've had a friend that went through there and yeah. she was talking to me last night just what a great facility it is and how friendly the staff is. How many employees there approximately? Me too. 11. Do they all park on site? They do not. We currently rent um, 11 parking spaces from La Fagadas. Uh, and we did that as part of the construction project um, because our parking lot at urgent care at the time um, there was some construction going on and we needed room for construction vehicles to come in and out and so we rented parking spaces from la fagadas um, for team members from urgent care center uh, so that the um, the construction didn't impede their ability to park near where they work and we've just maintained the use of those and some of our team members still park there is that going to continue with the new building as well? Yes. <clears throat> Any 
Any other questions from Ms. Montgomery? <coughs> Any other um, evidence from the applicant? Ma'am? Uh, hi, my name is Kathleen Saunders, and I'm with Quiet and Associates, and we submitted the site plan. Um, I just wanted to briefly speak to the parking. Uh, Kelly went over very detailed, so I won't take that long. Um, the Institute of Transportation Engineers um, journal that we went through that recommended the parking said that a parking rate of three and a half to four and a half spaces per a thousand square foot is recommended for an outpatient cancer treatment center. And so that would require 52 to 67 spaces for this site. And we've provided 57 spaces at this, at this point. So that's kind of the, uh, the goal that we were going for on this facility. And that's why we chose that for our parking ratio. But I'm here for any other uh, technical questions you might have on the site plan. All right, are there any questions for Ms. Saunders? Any at all? All right, thank you. Any, anything further from the applicant at this time? All right, thank you very much. All right, is there anyone else who has been sworn to present evidence who wishes to present evidence regarding this application at this time? If so, please approach the podium and present your evidence. <clears throat> Good morning, Mayor, uh, commissioners, and city members. Um, first responders, thank you very much for what you do for our town and the people here. Uh, my name is John Costoulis. Um, I live at 40, well, we own, my wife and I own, um, the property at 4931 South Passageway. And I uh, wanted to start out by saying, I don't know if we're the typical homeowner, vacation homeowner. Um, in the area, but we really cons we are really concerned about both our property from a rental management perspective, but also of the town of Nags Head. And we are very supportive of the project that you heard today. Um, when the Radiation Center came in, beautiful facility, nice looking aesthetics. Um, we love what the hospital has done with that property, and we're very supportive of what they plan to do with that property. Um, we appreciate Amy reaching out to us and talking to us about their thoughts about what was happening and get our concerns up front. Little concern now because this is in front of you and there has not been any follow-up, both by the hospital or the planning board to the residents. I have not gotten any or received. I have not received any feedback about what their plans were, nor have we received any feedback from the planning department or the planning commission uh, about what this project was about. Until about a week ago. We happen to be in town because we're thinking about developing another property in the, in the Nags Head area, and we saw the little signs posted on the property that this was coming up for consideration for your vote. Secondly, we received about three days ago, maybe four days ago, I received about three or four days ago, a notice in the mail that this was happening. So that gave me pause for concern. So I took a day and a half, drove down, spent the night last night, not knowing what we would hear today. Um, they've addressed many of our concerns. Um, but I think you've heard today about some concerns about parking, and there will be a parking analysis. I would recommend if you would consider doing a traffic flow analysis prior to your approval. Understand the traffic down passageway currently and understand what it would look like after approving this project. My major, major concern is there's a lot of kids that come in in the summertime that are playing in the streets, in the roads there um, because of the vacation rental uh, opportunities there. And we just heard today again about uh, trucks, delivery trucks, delivering medical equipment, um, passenger vans dropping off equipment. It's not so much of a concern of people coming in from the north because they will turn in and they will re egress back out to the bypass road because it's a right turn only there 
on the bypass road. But the people coming from the south will enter the facility in the right direction. But when they leave, they're going to leave that property and they will not go all the way down to Dare Trail to turn down, to go back up to Mall Drive, to go to the stoplight and go south. They will come down Passage Road. And it would be interesting to understand the increase in traffic flow and the impacts to potential both rentals and to um, when you mix children and increase traffic, there's an opportunity for trouble. Um, so I don't know if something can be done by the hospital or in the design that limits the traffic flow um, is, was probably my concern and I know my next door neighbor's concern um, on that property. Again, I don't want this to be a showstopper, but I would really think somebody needs to take a look at the traffic flow and see what can be done to minimize the impact down that road. The design they presented is beautiful. I don't think it'll impact our vacation rentals. I think the parking lot with the nice trees and what they've done um, with the radiation treatment center has been fantastic. Um, but I, I'm concerned about the traffic flow. Mr. Yes, Kasoulis, uh, does the board have any questions for Mr. Kasoulis? Members. Um, does the applicant have any questions for him? All right. Thank you very much, sir. Is there anybody else who wishes to present evidence regarding this application who has been sworn? Does the applicant have any rebuttal evidence to present? Does the board wish to receive any further evidence regarding this before you begin your deliberations? May I ask a question to uh, the deputy planner? Yes, sir. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Kelly, in your knowledge that the street that they're entering this parking lot on um, off that Borders Passage Way that Mr. Catullus was talking about there, the access off of 158 that goes into, that goes to um, Virginia Day Trail if that connection, which is private, correct? Yes. If passageway was at that point a cul-de-sac where you couldn't enter from that private access point, would that be a possibility? Um, let me pull it up real quick just so we can. Okay, so this is the access that you're asking about and potentially creating a cul-de-sac in this area? Potentially, yeah, create the cul-de-sac on passageway and that would eliminate any concerns for the neighborhood. I can't say whether that's something that we could do at this point or not. That would obviously create um, a different situation for for these two lots, um, and it would require reconsideration of the subdivision plat, obviously. So I, I'm hesitant to say that that would be a resolution for that. Just uh, maybe to add to that, I would suggest that if that's a consideration, if the concerns um, are something that the board wishes to follow up on, then, then the practice probably, probably would be to have a traffic engineer assess the conditions and assess whether there's a potential negative impact on passageway. Um, alternatively, you know, we've recommended a condition that requires a follow-up uh, analysis of the parking at six and 12 months. Um, you could expand that follow-up analysis to require uh, a traffic assessment as part of that as well and to determine the impact, well, uh, if there is any impact on passageway, <coughs> and if there is any impact in terms of increased traffic on passageway at that six month and 12 month period, um, then there may be a need for the applicant to consider signage, 
other, other means to reduce, their, reduce that impact. In the absence of any assessment, though, I, I would be hesitant to, to propose a solution to something. With less investigation, moving that street to a one-way street flowing south to north would eliminate that exit out to that road without having to do all of the other rezoning. Potentially. My suggestion, again, would be that you, we may be proposing a solution to a problem that doesn't actually exist. But without, so the situation is if we wait and do a study of traffic, the hospital is hindered with months of study that they won't be able to move forward. If we don't do the study and we don't look at this issue of the street now, then and we approve this and there is a problem, now we are encroaching on two different lots that aren't in this study that we need to look at. So I, again, if the suggestion is that there potentially could convert this street to one-way traffic, well, my suggestion would be is to, again, require a study at six and 12 months after CO. That doesn't encumber the hospital, they're operating. And then you actually see the effects of that operation on the street. And if based on that study, based on that analysis, there's an actual effect on passageway and the solution is to convert it to one way, you can still do that. It doesn't encumber um, the hospital. And if there are legitimate issues um, materializing on passageway, you learn about them and if the solution is to make it one way, then you do that. I'll, I don't believe there is an option to create a cul-de-sac there without encumbering portions of the lots that the hospital is seeking to acquire or the two other lots that are undeveloped um, on the corner there. Ms. Cahoon, question? Question, Michael. Can't tell by looking at it. I didn't look at a traffic control map. Is passageway public or private? Public. Okay, thank you. Let's go up to side streets, private. Yeah. Any other, any other questions? Yes, Mr. Fuller. Um, I don't know if this is a question of you or a question of staff, but I'll ask it. Um, it came out today, unbeknownst to me, that the hospital is renting 11 parking spaces from La Fagata. So my question really concerns La Fagata, and that is, or to you, are we just looking at this without La Fagata? And the yeah. point being is, if they're renting 11 parking spaces from La Fagata, does that put La Fagata out of compliance with our ordinance? The, the, the issue for y'all to consider at this point is whether the application meets the requirements of the ordinance without regard to the impact on other properties. Um, so uh, the La Fagata issue, I think, is something you can take up at a later time to see whether or not that's an, that's an issue. But I think the question maybe you don't have this question, but the question I, I see is, um, are they in compliance with the requirements, the parking requirements of the ordinance with or without those rented spaces? That's one of the questions I think that might be apparent. Well, well the answer to that is they're seeking a reduction in parking, mm -hmm. but yet they're renting parking places. Do, do staff have any response to that? So when we performed our analysis, we were not aware uh, that they were running parking spaces. My um, understanding is that it was a matter of convenience. I think that that technically has no bearing on this application. It may have bearing on the use of La Fagata, although I understand that they have excess parking on the site. If they have, hopefully they have it to the degree um, where they can rent 11 spaces. But. All that being said, our analysis was based on um, the proposed use of the facility and the justification for the reduction based on the cancer center use in the ITE uh, journal article that was provided. And based on that, based on the square footage of the space, based on the number of employees, um, I, I believe that they have justified that the parking is sufficient based on the reduction. And 
I, I don't know that, that the need or use of off-site parking for employees um, necessarily affects this proposal. It may affect it positively if we were to consider that, assuming it doesn't negatively affect the use of the La Fagata site. Um, you, you answered my question that it's a separate and total issue. <coughs> I'll bring up the La Fagata issue later in the meeting. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Cahoon? Michael, uh, then as part of your analysis at six and 12 months, whatever, will that be part of your analysis, the use of off-site parking? We could take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I think if they're actu actually using it, I think we need to take that into consideration, especially if it's not something that's, that's binding upon La Fagata that or that be, site. As we've seen in the past, shared parking and different things can change on a whim. Correct, yes. And that would part, need to be part of the analysis, I would think. I agree. Um, Michael, while you're at the podium, if you would uh, briefly address what our procedures for notice are for conditional uses. It's my understanding that, that the sign and mail notice for this public hearing, which is the only notice requirement under the UDO, would be for this particular public hearing, uh, were sent out and posted 15 days ago uh, as required. Uh, there is no required, uh, there is not a public hearing before the planning board. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no notice requirement beyond um, posting of the agenda. Um, and materials for, for the planning board me meeting, materials for this meeting are available online. You know, perhaps that's not as widely known as, as we might hope it would be. Um, but I don't recall, um, we've spoken with some individuals that had an interest about this, this project um, and tried to answer any questions, but uh, I don't recall that this particular individual that spoke today reached out to the department with any questions. But the, the mail notice is 15 days prior to this public hearing, correct. no notice required for uh, planning board meeting, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions for staff? Uh, does the applicant have any further evidence to introduce? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Saunders, if you'll. Um, I just wanted to speak to um, one thing the, po the hospital has offered to do is to post signs within the facility um, stating that patients shouldn't use passageway for their exit. Um, maybe that would help alleviate some of the issue, but we could also evaluate at six and 12 months, as Michael has suggested. I wanted to speak to the 11 spaces um, that are on La, La Fagata's property. Those 11 spaces were originally obtained and they are not deeded, so they're not permanent. Um, that's why we're not considering them with this application because they could go away at any time. They were originally obtained just for construction and they were only supposed to be used during construction. As you know, the urgent care facility has a wider range of patients than an infusion center would. So the current urgent care facility, as is noted in your narrative, is currently underparked based on today's standards. At the time that that came in as a site plan, it was probably appropriately parked, but based on current use and current uh, medical office facility parking rates, it's underparked. And so those parking spaces are being used for the urgent care facility. Once that urgent care facility goes away and it's replaced by an infusion center, uh, we believe that the parking rates would go down and that's kind of uh, spelled out within your narrative as well, that fewer people would be using the facility based on the use because the urgent care has walk-ins or, um, while the infusion center has specific appointments that are maybe two, three hours long, and so it's only gonna be one person there at that time instead of having walk-ins coming in regularly. That's all I wanted to say. Great. Questions. Questions for Ms. Saunders? Um, but your testimony was, collectively, your testimony was you still intend to rent those 11 spaces and continue to use them in the future. That was your testimony. So I don't know what you're talking about now. I'm talking about the 11 parking places on La Fagata and La Fagata issue, not the hospital. Okay, well those 11 spaces are still being rented and there's no end date for that, I think is what's being stated. Um, but they're not deeded with the property or anything like that, so it's not a permanent fix for anything. 
that's why they were not considered with the site plan that was submitted because they could go La Fagata could pull the agreement at any time so we were parking the proposed facility based on required parking rates for just that facility so, it doesn't even come close to answering my question but thank you <laughs> other questions for Ms. Saunders anything at all anything further Ms. Saunders no. or for the applicant at all does the board wish to receive any other evidence before you begin your deliberations anything at all all right at this time we will conclude the evidentiary presentation um, and the board may begin its deliberations I will point out that there are two separate actions that you need to take the uh, the first is the well I think in order the first would be approval of the uh, rezoning request which um, uh, is not a conditional request and then the second would be uh, an action regarding the uh, actual site vested site uh, plan application the the actual zoning is a very simple motion correct to approve the rezoning request as presented that yes sir that's correct and if so i make that motion second I have a motion and second to approve the rezoning request as presented any further discussion from sf2 to um, SPD2. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Then we would proceed to consideration of the conditional use site plan. And if someone well, either wishes to enter discussion or make a motion for the purpose of discussion, <coughs> that would be in order. I got to get to the language first. I'd, I'd be happy to make a motion, but I'm going to need help framing the motion. Okay. Well, um, because wait, wait, just the, to give uh, Commissioner Cahoon just a second to get, to, to, the, get to, the, to the section where the findings of fact. Yeah, are. that's yeah. that's the point I'm going to have. That's what I'm looking for. Can I just say that we accept the findings of fact as presented, or we got to read them all? No, you, you need to make the individual findings. Okay. Um, I wish somebody else would make a motion. I'll be glad to make a motion once I find Please. it. Please. <laughs> I can't find it. I've got to find the applicable language. Um, There's a page I, number that we can go to. That'd be great. Yes, staff, can you direct us to the page for the yeah. uh, We're going through use. 108 pages, so it's kind of hard to find. So in the, uh, in the staff report, uh, it would be on page 7 of 9. Thank you. Um, oh, staff. So there, there are... For the conditional use permit, there are essentially two sets of findings. There um, are the basic um, findings related to all conditional use permits, the four that you see there, and then um, which is what you would have as findings for the vested right site plan. You would also have those same findings plus an additional five related to the reduction of the loading zone and the reduction of the number of required parking spaces. So a, a total of uh, nine findings related which, to the, which are, the application. Which run from pages seven of nine to eight of nine. Correct, yes sir. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the vested right site plan application with the findings of fact that one, the use will not materially endanger the public health and safety if located where proposed and developed according to the plan as presented. The use as proposed will not overburden the firefighting capabilities and the municipal water supply capacity of the town as such facilities and capabilities will, be, will exist on the completion date of the conditional use for which application is made. Three, the conditional use will be in harmony with the existing development and uses within the area in which it is to be located. Four, adequate utilities, access roads, drainage, parking, or other necessary facilities have been or are being provided. 
discuss the first set of facts. Yes. That's my motion. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay. I have a motion and a second um, on the vested right site plan with those findings of fact. Michael, you had something to say? Yes, I just wanted to make sure. Were you intending to make a separate motion on the conditional use? Mm -hmm. We would have yeah. to. It's going to be a yeah. Thank you. Yes. Just make sure. All right, so that has been motioned and seconded to approve the vested right site plan with those uh, findings of fact. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And now a motion on the conditional use parking would be in order. I'll make a motion that we approve the conditional use permit based on the above analysis and following recommended conditions. And further, that the site plan be developed in compliance with the plan stated December 5, 2019, revised as necessary to comply with the conditions of approval. Modifications to the project prior to the issuance of a CO shall be considered and processed as a minor site plan or major site plan pursuant to Article 4 of the UDO. And second, that at six months and 12 months following the issuance of a CO, an assessment of sufficiency of parking shall be conducted by a third party traffic engineer engaged and the cost borne by the owner developer of the property with the qualifications acceptable to the town of Nags Head Director of Planning and Development. This assessment shall determine whether the parking provided on site is sufficient and does not result in increased traffic congestion or otherwise negatively impact existing traffic flow or pedestrian and vehicular safety and or does not create parking impacts for adjacent properties or within town rights of way. Further, this assessment shall recommend whether the provision of additional parking space is necessary if on-site parking is determined to be uh, deficient. This assessment shall be presented to the Director of Planning and Development for acceptance and final determination as to whether additional parking is required to be provided with any determination to be made within 18 months of the issuance of the CO and any additional parking to be provided within 24 months of issuance of a CO. Further, signs shall be installed on site to be approved by the Director of Planning and Development or his or her designee directing deliveries by vehicles larger than the reduced loading zone can accommodate to the main Outer Banks Hospital located at 4800 South Croatan Highway. The second. I have a motion and a second, but I believe there are still five conditions that well, were not. Well, the the I want I just wanted to make sure and I, I, findings I, that there were there were five specific findings that need to be made as part of that motion, and maybe you maybe you mentioned those. I just wasn't clear, but those are the ones that start at the bottom of page seven, and carry over to page number eight. Those are findings one through I, five. Did you mention those? I I believe that we passed those five. And in what I said in my own words was that it referred to the conditions above. We passed the first four, John, was my motion. That's correct. The first four were by themselves. But there are, but there are additional preliminary findings that I need to make. I don't think these are duplicative. I think that they are. They are separate. That's right. That's, That's right. So I think those, those five and findings was, need to be included. That was Webb's, I thought, motion. I just would, I wanted to make sure that that was included. That was yes. all I was asking. Oh, okay. yes. All right. Thank you. Mine were four. His were five. Right. Okay. Correct. So the, the motion is to approve the conditional use permit with the five conditions uh, or five findings, five findings of fact mm -hmm. that are in the report in addition to the three um, recommendations of staff which we have read just a moment ago. Is that correct? That's correct. Very good. Is there a second? I second. You seconded that. Sorry. So we do have a motion and a second. I believe we've gotten that all clear. Any further discussion? Just one bit. I, I would trust that what 
the motion that I made mm -hmm. addresses the concerns both of what we talked about in terms of parking, mm -hmm. um, delivery, and the gentleman that spoke about traffic flow on passageway. I mean, that's specifically what this discusses. Yes. So I hope that satisfies the individual that is here that has a house over there. Um, I'm not sure if it does, but at least the motion is meant to indicate that that concern needs to be addressed in the next few months. The, the motion clearly requires that that be addressed at specific times and in a specific manner. Michael. Uh, if that's the intent, I would suggest that um, condition two be expanded to assess not just the sufficiency of parking, but also traffic impacts on passageway. Um, and that the assessment, uh, this would be in the second full sentence, but basically that the assessment um, take into account how the site contributes, um, operation of the site contributes to uh, traffic and vehicular speeds on passageway. May I ask you, in number two, yes, sir. one of the things I read is this assessment shall determine whether the parking provided on site is sufficient and does not result in increased traffic congestion or otherwise negatively impact existing traffic flow. I think that satisfies that concern. I think my sense would be that um, that the condition or the, the review here is whether or not the reduction of parking is sufficient and the concern I heard from the gentleman might relate to any operation of, of this site uh, and whether or not any operation of the site results in traffic conditions regardless of whether parking is or is not sufficient um, on passageway and whether or not the board wants to take that into account. As the person making the motion, I think the statement about parking stands on its own and the assessment about does not result in any uh, increased traffic congestion stands on its own. I think they both stand on their own. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you very much. Uh, the board will take a, about a 10 minute recess. Okay, the board has uh, returned from its break. The next item on our agenda are uh, reports and recommendations from the planning board and the planning and development director. Thank you. So uh, again, a monthly report about the activities uh, of the Planning and Development Department. I won't go over all of these. Happy to expand on any of them or answer any questions that the board has, but I did want to mm -hmm. at least address a few items. Um, you should, by the end of today, uh, you and the Planning Board will receive a memo uh, and a draft um, flood prevention ordinance uh, for discussion at the Planning Board meeting at the joint discussion on February 18th. Uh, and we'll also uh, give you some thoughts about changes that may need to be made to building height, the measurement of building height, and uh, fill provisions that are associated with those. Um, and uh, we'll send those out this afternoon. Uh, and then the three items at the top of page two, so regulation of large occupancy slash event homes. I had attached a, uh, a memo um, from Kelly Wyatt on behalf of the planning board uh, the Planning Board would like to consider pursuing um, regulations that require registration uh, of events such as weddings and other events uh, at single-family homes that would draw a um, larger number of, of visitors and guests. And so they're, they essentially discussed it at their last meeting uh, and wanted to get feedback and input from the Board of Commissioners before they pursued that. Um, if the board had any direction or preference that that's something that they not concentrate on, I think that would be um, 
constructive feedback on that. Uh, I've given you uh, a report on planning and development department permitting process for the second quarter of the current fiscal year. Um, and we have continued um, our trend over the last uh, three quarters to reduce our average review time in terms of days. Um, every time I think I say we can't reduce it any further and staff manages to reduce it further. So I would say at 4.23 days average turnaround, I, I can't expect we can get lower than that. I think uh, I um, suggest to staff that it's great that we're getting that turnaround and, and I think that's a good um, turnaround benchmark and obviously we don't want to uh, reduce the quality uh, or thoroughness of our reviews in, in, in sake of, uh, of having um, any lower in terms of turnaround time. And then finally, um, recent discussions that we've had about uh, potential interest in, in properties, uh, specifically the Blue Heron, Ho Blue Heron Motel, um, has given us some interest in looking at, um, and this is something, a policy that is addressed in the comprehensive plan, but looking at legacy establishments and legacy structures and having some way to treat those in the UDO um, beyond the current um, provisions, which really are, are non-conformity provisions, which don't give us a lot of flexibility, don't give property owners um, or those looking to redevelop and reinvest in non-conforming properties uh, a lot of flexibility and a lot of options to do so. And so um, we're pr proposing this uh, or presenting this to the board is something we would at least like to prioritize uh, and present some options at least initially to the planning board for discussion. And I think the rest of the items um, speak for themselves. Again, unless um, the board has any specific questions about those items um, or anything else covered in the memo. Okay. Board members, yes, yeah. Renee. Michael, I have a question as it relates to our permitting software that we're working on. Mm -hmm. Do we have a designated point person that will be handling all of that and trying to coordinate all the bugs out of it and so forth? Yeah, so there's a few uh, staff persons in the town uh, that work with the permitting software, and, and it's not just permitting software, obviously, it's our financial software as well. Uh, I depend on uh, Lily, as well as Ed Snyder in the department. Um, Ed is kind of our super user, and Lily being our permitting coordinator is probably the one that interfaces with it the most. Um, in terms of the permitting side of things, we all recently went to Currituck County and met with Bill Noons, and he walked us through uh, some of their processes, internal processes, and, and back end of that software and how they use it. Um, and our primary focus was on their use of it for online permitting. Um, we've set a benchmark of, uh, or a timeline of, of the, I believe it's the first Monday in March, I think it's March 3rd, of having um, online trade permitting roll out. And so we're actually meeting this afternoon to make sure what additional steps we may need to take to make sure that that happens. Um, but then we also uh, depend on Amy, I think, as, as uh, the primary contact with Tyler and, and um, with, with Munis um, and our IT person uh, whenever uh, they are going to begin in the department or the, the town. I thought we had an IT company that would already be willing to Shoshin. do all that. Yeah. yeah, we depend on them as well. And, um, you know, when we have issues that need to be resolved, we do work with them as well um, quite a bit if, if we need troubleshooting, if we have issues with the operation of the software. Uh, less so if it's on the day-to-day -day use of it. Usually we would only rely on them in terms of the department if we had an issue that, they, that we needed their assistance resolving where it was clear that um, the software wasn't working on our local platforms and there was some need to resolve an issue. The reason I ask is it was my understanding in talking with some people in Currituck that they, they had a person that ended up working doing a lot of work on weekends and trying to work throughout all the kinks and the bugs in the system and how much time it took to implement um, by having a dedicated person that was put in a lot of hours on it. Mm -hmm. That that worked better for them. 
Yeah, I, I would say, you know, there are, we, we try to engage everyone here that uses the software in solving the issues and problems. I think ultimately it's important that there are people that are accountable for it. Um, it's not for me to say necessarily who that is in the town, maybe more so for, for Cliff. I perceive who I think is the accountable person that if we have problems, if Lily or Ed has problems, who we go to or who we loop into that conversation. Um, and, you know, it's certainly Shoshin, you know, it's certainly Amy to a degree, and it will certainly be um, whomever is put into the IT position. Thank you. Mike. Win. Just one, one quick thing about the legacy established structures. Um, I would hope that we would be moving in a direction that would be all carrot, no stick. And that if somebody wants to redevelop their property and it meets our rules, that there won't be any new impediments um, to stop that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you. I mean, this was, this coming up now was born out of a meeting that we had where we quickly recognized that there was not a lot of flexibility for people to, for a non-conforming use. <coughs> there wasn't a lot of opportunity for someone to evolve and expand on that use, to change it, to make it something um, maybe more dynamic than it currently was, even though it might be the same use. And then similarly with, with pre-existing non-conforming structures, um, that there were limitations by that des designation as well. So I think this would this is entirely, you know, looking positively, looking to encourage people to to do something to preserve these businesses and, and buildings. As someone who's been through something like this before, mm -hmm. um, one thing you find out quickly is don't give people false hope mm -hmm. because a lot of things that may not meet town standards even if you change the standard you still got state and federal issues to deal with and so and most of them have that federal and state if you're on the ocean front yeah. so I, I i would not want to just try to change a town standard <clears throat> giving people false hopes when they can't get past the state or federal standard yeah it's something we'll take into account of course camera regulations floodplain regulations um and, and even building code obligations. Some of those we may not be able to change, but I think we need to at least make sure that, um, you know, I think Mike has brought up several times, we don't want to allow something that's not truly allowed. And so we want to set those expectations pretty clearly. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, any particular guidance from the board on um, event houses beyond what, the, beyond the conversation that, um, maybe that we had at the retreat, the concerns that we had about their offsite impact, primarily about offsite impacts, including uh, parking and noise, I know were, were big topics. Well, I read in the memo that Kill Devil Hills is looking at this as it relates to building code and um, stack parking. Well, it's perhaps getting together with them to see how we can merge some ideas. Well, I mean, the other times, because every time's grappling with this. I, I'm not sure Kitty Hawk is, but obviously Southern Shores is. is. Yeah. Um, so it would be a good idea. Do we know, Michael, how many event, per se, houses we have in Nags Head? No, we, we haven't. <clears throat> That's not something we've tried to determine in any way. I think you... I think between the police chief and I, we could anecdotally probably identify a few, and, and there are some um, companies that are specifically advertising event homes, um, which are simply single family homes that are large enough to accommodate events. Uh, and there are some of those that are located within the town. Yeah, but few, because I think Nag said overall has done a great job limiting the size of these structures and the, and the amount of bedrooms with lot coverage and, and the fact that we don't have a sewer system that they're tying into eliminates the 28 bedrooms that most of these functions are happening at. I mean, that is something we did talk about with the planning board is that because this originally came up because of um, 
perspectives about what Kill Double Hills was doing in terms of originally they're petitioning um, the state building code. I'm not going to name the, the organization correctly, but the, the building code body at the state level um, and suggesting that homes for large occupancy and events be considered differently, you know, not commercially, not residentially, but some different category. And I think the discussion was we are in a different place than Kill Level Hills in terms of what we allow in terms of the feasible maximum of a house that can be constructed here in the number of bedrooms. So we don't necessarily have the same issues that they have and I think that speaks to that. Do we still have issues with parking? Without a doubt. And, and that's something we can look at. And I think the planning board was coming from it less about the, um, I think originally it was about the occupancy concern, but more so about when events are held at homes and how those are dealt with. But we can certainly look at, at both sides of it. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. What about the what about workforce housing? <clears throat> so provided the board with a memo, essentially the report from phase one. Uh, staff had worked with DJG uh, staff, the, the architectural consultant, the on-call architectural consultant for the town. And if you recall, this was a three-phase project in phase one. Um, we had hoped to be presenting to you at this meeting, um, and we are, so that's good. We're on, on task. Um, and the results of the, of the tasks that we had identified and, and the scope for that. Um, there is, and I identified at least one task that we've not completed yet, and that was to coordinate public input with regard to suitable sites. And based on what is coming out of this, these phase one tasks that we have performed, um, we had considered doing a survey, but I thought it was probably best to get the board's input so as not to um, have anyone perceive that sites were or were not being considered for housing um, that were not acceptable to the board. Uh, because some of the sites, the seven that we ultimately uh, reviewed, may or may not be um, I ideally suitable to the board for various reasons. So, um, But essentially, the first task that we performed was an inventory of properties available or potentially available for the development or reuse for affordable housing for the town's workforce. And we estimate that, um, again, this is generally for or primarily for the seasonal lifeguard staff, um, non-local, anywhere between 25 and 30 every season. Uh, and so that's primarily what we would be looking at in terms of numbers. So we inventory all, inventoried all of the town properties. Uh, the town owns a total of 96 properties. Um, and that includes, uh, at least maybe erroneously for this purpose, but that does also include some properties which the town has an ownership interest in, which could be discounted, which would be, for instance, the skate park at the Y, or portions of properties um, that make up the Soundside event site that, that, that the town does not have a controlling interest in. So we did not consider those. We only considered properties that the town solely had interest in. But again, that makes up a total of 96 properties. So based on the inventory, um, we, we did a preliminary assessment of site suitability for housing. We assigned a score of three for suitable, um, two for sites that we deemed marginal and one for sites that we deemed unsuitable. Uh, only two properties received a three, uh, six properties received a two, and the remaining 88 properties received a one. And of those um, properties that we selected for further consideration, there were seven properties. The two that received a three were the Outer Banks Medical Center site and the Satterfield Playing Fields. <coughs> Um, when we investigated Satterfield a little longer, I can't say that they wouldn't have um, warranted a two based on the uh, agreements and, and funding that goes along with the use of that property. Um, but we also rated Town Hall, Bonnet Street, 
uh, fire station 16 and the Epstein beach access as twos and then Nags had ocean rescue station as a one. Um, the majority of the properties owned by the town were, were determined to be unsuitable. Um, generally that was based on their size and I note here that 66 properties uh, are less than one half acres in size which um, was not something we looked at but it, it is a fact that they are that size and we start to have diminishing returns in terms of their suitability for development. Um, alternatively, uh, properties were ranked a one because of existing use or conditioning limiting development, whether that be parks, for instance, Dowdy Park, uh, or public works facilities, which were uh, necessary facilities to continue operations at, or were unsuitable in terms of mixing residential use with their use or conservation land or marsh conditions. Um, the, the most sizable properties that the town owns are obviously um, in Nags Head Woods, uh, and we did not consider those properties as being suitable um, for this uh, consideration. Uh, two of the properties that were received at two were ultimately not select for, selected for further consideration. Uh, one of those was the, um, the town's interest in the skate park at the Y. Uh, and also uh, the Public Works Debris Yard on Lark Avenue, um, given generally the use and location of that property. And <clears throat> we did select uh, the Nags Head Ocean Rescue Station, despite it only receiving a one, <coughs> uh, because we, we did understand that the board, maybe not this board, but um, there has been previous interest uh, in the use of that property or reuse of that property. But because of the size of it, we did score that property a one, and, and I think that comes out when um, we look at the assessments that were performed by DJG. So the next task, or the next two tasks, were to identify stakeholders, um, or, or excuse me, I, yeah, identify stakeholders who we would interview to determine uh, needs and preferences with respect to housing. Um, and so I've listed the stakeholders here. There are Cliff Ogburn and Andy Garman, Chad Motts and Ken Savage, uh, both involved with Ocean Rescue, Mike Norris involved with facilities maintenance, and then we had a good opportunity that Chad was able to coordinate where we um, had four former um, Ocean Rescue staff persons, younger individuals that had been lifeguards um, that were uh, willing to um, respond to questions about uh, their interest and needs and preferences. So we've given you the, the questions and I've summarized the, the responses here. Um, some of the responses are divergent. Generally, there's a summarized response that is from uh, more of the perspective of staff in terms of the workforce that would need the housing and, and some that's more of the perspective of, of the administration side of, of town government. But um, I've summarized the, the major takeaways at the end. Uh, DJG had, had done this actually based on the interviews, but I guess the best summaries are the workforce housing employees are most concerned with housing location, cost, and privacy. The ideal workforce housing scenario would incorporate all employees in the same location, but would also allow for some separation in privacy. Uh, the selected property will ideally be located in northern Nags Head, close to the beach, and separated from residential neighborhoods. A living arrangement that allows people to congregate but have their own private spaces is strongly preferred. A cottage-style living arrangement has been successful in the past. Uh, the workforce housing employees have a need or strong desire for outdoor showers, gathering spaces, study areas, if the living arrangement is not private, and storage areas. The selected property would ideally be able to accommodate an outdoor shower, outdoor storage, outdoor gathering space, and an indoor multi-use gathering space and maintenance room. Uh, the number of people sharing facilities such as kitchens and bathrooms should be limited to three to five in order for upkeep to be manageable. Uh, it is important that we are presenting the staff with housing options that equal or better, uh, that are equal or better than what they would find elsewhere. This includes cost, location, and living arrangement considerations. So the next uh, task um, was for a preliminary windshield assessment of the properties that were identified as, as suitable, or at least the ones, uh, the seven properties that we selected for that uh, task. 
Um, and I've attached um, the assessments performed by uh, DJG, which I can go through in a second. But um, again, there were seven properties. Um, generally, the expectation is that only the Outer Banks Medical Center and Satterfield playing field sites could accommodate uh, development, providing housing for all staff needed. However, in both, ca both cases, buildings would need, um, additional buildings would be necessary. And at least with respect to Satterfield playing fields, existing use and or agreements may preclude such development. Um, the size and use of the remaining sites, whether it be Town Hall or Bonnet Street Beach Access or the Fire Station 16 or Epstein or the Nagset Ocean Rescue would preclude the housing of all workforce and or the development of additional building areas. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be true. It would just, um, they would, I, I think any new building would be compromised in terms of how large or where it could be located. And it's also important to mention that existing zoning precludes the development of multifamily cottage court or dormitory uses from all but two sites, Bonnet Street and the Naxxed Ocean Rescue Site. And that's zoning from a use perspective, not even taking into account um, any lot coverage or setbacks uh, that may compromise uh, the use of those sites. Um, so I'll jump down to the, to the property reviews real quick because we're there. Um, but in terms of the Outer Banks Medical Center, um, you know, the, the positives that DJG assessed were that the site is not necessarily in a residential area, although you have to travel through a residential area to get there. Um, the site does have adequate parking. The site does have an existing building that they believe could be um, remodeled to accommodate, but it wouldn't be able to accommodate all um, staff. There would need to be additional building to do that. Um, major building renovation would be required. ADA upgrades would be required. A rezoning or zoning changes would be required. Um, the property is in a special environmental zone intended to protect habitat, and the site is fairly remote from the beach. Um, again, here is where um, that site is located. Backing up to Nagshead Woods. Uh, the second site we looked at was the Satterfield Playing Fields. Um, it's a sizable property, um, approximately 13 acres with approximately 10 acres buildable again, but most of that is um, subject to existing, pre-existing agreements. Uh, the site can be adequately buffered from residential areas. The site does has, have adequate parking, does have sub substantial open space, uh, could conceivably uh, um, accommodate 100% of the, the workforce. Cluster housing is permitted. Uh, the site is in close proximity to the beach and is located in the northern area of Nags Head. Obviously, the site negatives the playing fields have an ongoing lease attached that is subject to grant funds. Um, no existing buildings available for use, so it would be all new construction. Uh, there are some stormwater management considerations on that property and it would, we would lose, uh, obviously, a public amenity. <coughs> the following sites are all either encumbered, again, by their existing use or size. Um, I won't necessarily go into these in detail, but the town hall property, obviously, where we are now, um, I think we're all familiar with it and familiar with what limitations it presents. Um, Bonnet Street Beach Access, obviously the new bathhouse there, there may be some ability to build on there, on that site, but it may sacrifice parking to do so. Uh, you certainly would not be able to accommodate 100% of the, the workforce there. Um, uh, then Fire Station 16, similar issues in terms of the existing use, whether or not um, a non fire employee, if we're talking about lifeguards, whether or not that's a compatible use to this site and its operation, and it's perhaps even more constrained uh, than this site, uh, Town Hall. Um, Epstein Beach Access, again, there may be an opportunity here, but it, it would be limited in terms of the number of housing uh, units that could be provided. And then um, Nags Head Ocean Rescue Station, uh, given the size of that site, um, location obviously is ideal, but the size of that property is very limiting. Um, 
not, we don't have an exact survey, but based on the aerial, based on the Dare County records, uh, the majority of existing parking is probably located in uh, the right of way of 158. So that site is, is significantly encumbered. Uh, again, you, maybe you can accommodate some housing there, um, less so if the expectation is that it still operates as an ocean rescue headquarters. Um, more so, but if it doesn't, but then we would have to find a new location for Ocean Rescue. So, um, in terms of policies, this is the next task uh, that was discussed in the scope. Um, there's nothing necessarily specific in terms of um, providing for workforce housing for the town's workforce housing. It's certainly in the comprehensive plan uh, the importance of Ocean Rescue and the seasonal lifeguard staff is referenced and there are policies that discuss um, having affordable housing opportunities but there's nothing necessarily that um, dictates any decision making with regard to the town's workforce housing um, except obviously this board is interested in pursuing that and, and I don't think that that's precluded or directed in any way by the comprehensive plan. I think um, with respect to the seven sites, perhaps the most relevant uh, policies pertain to preservation of single family neighborhoods and ensuring um, that uh, the character of, of, of certain character areas is not diminished by um, land use decisions or the use of any sites. Um, you know, it's interesting that perhaps the, the best two sites, the Outer Banks Medical Center and the Satterfield Playing Fields, um, while they may have the most development potential based on area, um, those projects or projects at those locations would um, be in close proximity to existing single family neighborhoods. So if those sites were considered, we would just need to make sure that however they were proposed to be developed, they would uh, take into account any impacts on single family neighborhoods in their design and use. So again, the remaining tasks we've not um, sought any public input at this time if the the next steps would be to solicit feedback from the board hopefully acceptance and, and adoption or acceptance of the findings that we've made in this report uh, and give us some direction with respect to when we originally had developed the scope we were thinking two sites that the board would like us to pursue as part of phase two which would mean uh, that DJG, the architectural consultant, would start to develop a fit test for those two sites. They would understand the preferences and with those two sites start to develop a, a physical form of, of what the building or development might look like. Um, understandably, the board may wish for us to seek further input from the public um, before they, they feel comfortable making that decision on what those two sites are. or uh, they may recognize that, that um, there may be limitations with even two of those seven sites or even any one of those seven sites. So maybe to try to help that along, um, I did indicate six kind of points um, or questions in my uh, report. Uh, number one, have all town properties been sufficiently considered? And I have a typo there where I didn't finish the thought, but are there properties that you believe were not given sufficient consideration? Again, we looked at the 96 properties, uh, selected seven. Are there ones that you know about or think about that you don't feel like we considered and would like us to at least respond why or, or reconsider? Uh, two, does the board believe that at least one or two of the properties considered warrant further consideration? If it's clear to the board, no, these two properties or this one property are the ones that we should pursue, then that's what, what we would like to know to go to phase two. Uh, does the board believe that one or more of the properties considered are not options and should not be considered? So um, perhaps in the alternative to number two and to whittle it down, are, are there ones that are completely obvious that we shouldn't consider? Uh, number four, does the board believe that development of housing on a singular property is possible or ideal? And that seemed to be what the preferences were based on our interviews that um, regardless of the form, 
that a singular property or singular development would be ideal versus um, perhaps looking at multiple properties and accommodating housing over mul multiple properties. But again, based on the property in the town's um, inventory, that may or may not be possible. That may or may not be dictated how we move forward. Um, and that kind of leads to question five, is the ideal property for workforce housing currently in the town's inventory? Um, and six, do the considered sites present opportunities for additional uses that may increase viability or potentially offset cost to the town? Um, and we've thought about this a little bit. Um, we think there are, um, depending on how the board decides to move forward, we think there may be some uh, potential partnerships um, that could materialize as part of phase two and that's where we would commit to, to investigating that further and seeing if that's something that should be presented to the board for discussion or consideration. And in that same vein, you know, I think this is an opportunity at this time for the board to decide, well, this, based on what we know, this is not the path we want to take. Um, we need to pursue an alternative and maybe there's a different way that we can look at um, providing for this identified need. So I think that's all I have. Um, happy to answer any questions or, or give you any thoughts. Well, I'm, I'm personally not ready to, I'd like to digest this further after today's presentation before <laughs> offering any direction myself. Um, I think I know what the answer is, but I'm not. I'm not ready for that, um, so I will ask board members. Uh, I'll pass. Okay. Kevin? Well, in, in phase one, when you talk about your findings, did you get something out of phase one that maybe we didn't already know that we, we find beneficial? Um, I, a lot of it, was, I thought this was a good exercise, at least for me. Um, you know, I, only being with the town for 11 months, I, I, it was good to go through this exercise. I, I think I said when we originally rolled this out, we don't have any preconceptions about where the ideal or what the ideal outcome is. And I, I think this maybe reaffirmed some of my thoughts. I don't know, I can't speak for the board whether it reaffirmed or, um, or disputed any thoughts that the board had held before they, they looked at this and considered this. Or if they think, you know, the conclusions are, are completely false and that's perfectly fine. And I think we need to understand that if there's expectations um, that are, you know, the contrast with, with what DJG is, has determined or what staff is determining, I think we need to know that. I think, um, you know, I think there are alternatives um, that could be considered, but um, you know, I, I don't. The path we're on is that: can we provide for affordable housing or for housing for our workforce on town-owned property? And I think that was kind of the hypothesis that was presented. And this is the project. This is the plan to determine that answer. If if we have determined that we can't or we can't in this way, then I think that's a different maybe process to go through. And this is not a reflection on you or your presentation. Please understand that. And sure. Understanding your limited time here. I myself didn't get anything out of it. Good. Looking at looking at the properties and the fact that we expended taxpayers' money to get that in phase one. Mm -hmm. Just and again, not a reflection on you. Sure. I know you're just presenting the information, but just was in my personal opinion was not impressed with it at all. Very good. not sure whether to give my comments now or under commissioner's agenda. Um, I would echo Commissioner Brinkley's comments. Um, granted, it was an exercise and probably a decent exercise for staff, whether it should have involved a consultant. I'm not sure we should have expended funds to a consultant on this particular exercise. Um, I was why you've addressed the Satterfield playing fields. I forget how much more years we have left on that 
um, agreement with the county, but that is a long-term agreement, so it doesn't, should not play into anything at this point in time when we have an agreement already in place. Um, while I understand that the YMCA shows up on town assets, we own 0% of that property, zero. Um, the only thing we have done is put in a skate park. Um, so I question sometimes the amount of, while they were dismissed, whether they were viable to begin with. Um, so before I'd expend any more funds, I need to see a better scope of work. Um, I think that staff um, probably could have done this exercise. I'm not sure what part of this particular exercise the consultant played into it. Um, but those are my comments right now, and I'll address the rest of them under Commissioner's agenda. I will agree with both commissioners. Um, I did the same exercise in 10 minutes while you presented that we were going to do this. Came up with nothing different. Um, with the, I guess the only difference is I thought about this as an outside the box situation instead of limiting it based solely on square footage of a lot size. And if we're going to use this only for lifeguards, I'm in total disagreement with it. There's a lot of town workforce that needs to be involved in this other than just the lifeguards. That's three months out of the year. We do take other employees that may or may not have access to housing when they first move here. Um, in your case, in the chief, both chiefs case, um, they could have taken a little more time to find housing instead of immediately moving their folks here. So I think that the, the scope of work that you did um, Although your report was great, again, I don't think that we looked at the town's benefits to our um, citizens, our taxpayers, with any respect when we did such a small, um, very narrow-minded research here and the, the funds that were spent. And I would make the suggestion to the board that we consider pushing back doing phase two until we come up with a better scope of use on that yeah. I mean I will say I would like um, I, I'd like to put this back a little bit um, to either mid-month or or the next month meeting um, I think what I, I would like to see is considering all of this drawing a uh, some kind of recommendation for sites I mean you know and why um, this you've kind of verbally narrowed this down I mean there's, there's kind of a logic to which sites are feasible here in this whole list um, and then um, uh, when we get ready to go into phase two um, a definition of the work product um, that we'll see from that if that's a list of you know site plan um, uh, typical unit plan what what is it we're going to see when we get to that phase uh, at the at the end of that phase and I um, can't remember if there's a cost projection in that but the cost projection should be feasible at that point um, if we have some idea if we're we're generating a, a site plan then we ought to be able to see we ought to be able to put some kind of numbers to that um, but, but um, I think the sort of the cap on this report would be a recommendation of here are the two or three sites that as a result of this appear to be viable and here's why those sites are viable and here's what we would recommend you consider yeah I'm if I could respond so I think I believe we've accomplished the tasks as set out in phase one based on the scope that was presented to the board. Um, whether or not um, you know, that provided the information that I think the board anticipated, you know, I'm happy to consider that. I would say that one of the specific items that was discussed when we presented the scope is whether or not there was an ability to accommodate 
housing needs of other town workforce. But I also recall that not every commissioner was um, maybe in agreement on that as being a priority of this. So I think it's items like that that we need to get some understanding about what is the intent of this outcome. Because we have, can have a difficulty providing the board with a recommendation if I were to have to stand here and provide the board with a recommendation today based on everything I know, there's only one site you look at. It's the Outer Banks Medical Center mm -hmm. site. Is that something that the board finds as the most feasible site? And the only reason I say that is because it seems like the preference is a singular site. Is it the ideal site? No. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the town owns the ideal site. Mm -hmm. I would tell you that the most viable option would be to look at multiple properties and spreading the workforce out and looking to privatize it somehow. That's my recommendation to you. Um, but I, I, again, there are multiple avenues. It's the, I need to understand the board's preference in terms of what are the outcomes that you hope to achieve. You know, what are the criteria by which this housing needs to be provided? Is cost a factor? Is cost not a factor? Is location the penultimate factor? Is the quality of this unit the ultimate factor? So, um, you know, I think, yes, I think that the intent of this task was to determine whether or not we had the ideal property in our inventory. And I think of the 96 properties that we have some owned interest in, um, we only have one property that could provide for all housing potentially. Mm -hmm. I, I think there may be other properties that we have owned interest in that may be more suitable. And I think there's private properties that we could leverage some arrangements with that might be even better ideal or more ideal. Yes. Well. Now I do have something, I guess, to respond. Um, one piece of property that is missing is the Tourist Bureau site, which we have a significant ownership interest in. And that's also a possibility of where something may go, in my opinion. But what I would also hope to get out of this is a cost benefit of doing something in terms of housing vis-a-vis -vis doing nothing in terms of housing, but in something compared to a, a competitive wage. And we did start that last year by adding, what, $1? Or, and the, then another dollar this year for people, cards? mainly for, for opportunity for housing. I think that was the driving thing. So there, there's another whole side of this, and that is, you know, What's the cost benefit of us building something and when's the payback vis-a-vis -vis providing lifeguards with a, a livable wage that they can find their own housing? Okay. Um, and perhaps maybe the, the last thing that's important to note is that the consultant's effort on this task was limited. They, they coordinated the interviews. Um, developed the questions and coordinated the interviews, and, I, and I, I'm thankful for them to do that. I think having their perspective and outside perspective unbiased, I think, is valuable to uh, pull out those perspectives. And then they also did the property site inventory, the, the, the um, um, windshield surveys, but they did that in concert with also the ADA work that I believe the board um, was aware of as well. So um, they were doing that work anyway as part of the ADA master plan. So that's important to note. And the only reason they're not here today is um, I didn't see value to having them here. I thought it was better to preserve their time for the future phases where they would be involved in design efforts. I would suggest that the board take this under consideration and that we um, come back to you with a set of recommendations for the future at a later at a later meeting very good <clears throat> thank you um, we are at almost noon and uh, we have at least an hour's work ahead of us if not more so um, what is the board's thought about um, lunch break at this point? And then come back to, to finish. I'm, I'm good till about 12.30, but after 12.30, I would want to take a break. Okay. 
because I, I I don't I don't foresee us finishing this uh, agenda by before twelve thirty. Um, so let's um, take a uh, one hour lunch break and reconvene at one o'clock. The board has returned uh, from its break. We will resume our meeting with um, new business, which would be committee reports. And I'll ask the commissioners if there are any uh, committee reports to be made. Nothing. Okay. Yep. I was assigned my committee, but have not had a meeting yet. <laughs> okay, great. Well, okay, thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is consideration of the audit contract. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, staff is recommending Potter and Company to perform the fiscal year 20 audit for the town of Nags Head for a minimum of three years with up to three additional renewal year options. <clears throat> One of the first things that stood out in making them the most qualified was the amount of hours that they allocated to the audit as well as the amount of time that <coughs> was partner and manager allocated, which was 240 hours or 96%. They have taken the time to map out the engagement to ensure that they can maintain their standard of providing the very highest level of service and ensuring the town will be a highly valued client to their firm. <coughs> their position is that a large on-site commitment from the partner and the manager in charge increases the efficiency and understanding in the audit process. And they are expected to be on site between 85% and 95% of the time. <clears throat> Potter has considerable familiarity with the Outer Banks and the challenges faced and experienced by the local governments in this region. They have 25 years of experience in auditing Dare County. And when I email David Clausen as Bob Taylor um, the partner in charge used him as a reference. It was an absolute yes, <laughs> due to the quality of the audit as well as the amount of partner time invested by Bob Taylor himself. <clears throat> Bob's and Potter's great degree of experience specializing in government accounting allows them to understand our needs and provide answers to unique situations that we have. They audit several clients that receive the GFOA Certificate of Achievement and are committed to assisting us in continuing to receive ours. They value long-term relationships and I hope that will now include the Town of Nags Head. So thank you for con your consideration. Thank you. Board members, do you have any questions for Amy? Um, only that I noted it was the most expensive proposal, anywhere from twelve dollars to $8,000 more per year. Right, and I think with ever increasing increases more than some of the rest of them. Um, yes, we, we did an RFP, but in the RFP it had indicated we would select the most qualified. So we actually had two separate envelopes. One was the qualifications and then the second envelope was the prices. So we opened the qualifications first and then the prices later. So our recommendation is based on the qualifications um, as well as the references. They, um, <clears throat> like I said, they, to me, the selling point is the partner engagement and the hours that they do put in the, the audit. And that's why on the spreadsheet, I kind of, the price is higher, but also the amount of odd hours are higher. And that would be, again, partner and manager time mostly. So I think that that would justify the reason that it's higher as well as um, hopefully back up our recommendation. <clears throat> Do you know what we paid for our most recent audit? 27500 <clears throat> The firm above the Potter firm has more um, senior staff hours, percentage of the total <clears throat> hours. Johnson Burgess? Yeah, so yes. they say they can do it in 203 hours and have uh, on staff person for 198 senior staff. Correct. I guess part of my recommendation as well was their current clients and Potter has clients that do CAFRs. They have clients that do single audits, 
which we have both, and that one did not. You're saying Johnson, Burgess, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. Johnson, Mazel, and that doesn't have that ability? They do. They just don't have any current clients that do a CAFR or have a single audit. But they still have the ability to do it. They just don't have a client right this minute that, do, that needs it. Correct. Okay, so, so they do have the ability to do it. And the 27.5 you said for the most recent one, when, when it looks under service provided, and again, I'm, I'm new to this, so please bear with sure, me. Sure, of course. But it talks about f financial compliance audits, GASB 34 assistance. It, did we get that? Yes, with our she did all that for us, yes. For a lot less. <clears throat> but here again, just don't read this wrong. Services provided only means that they're doing that right now with that unit of government. It doesn't mean that all these other ones don't have that exact same service. It's just that they're not doing it today. Okay. But that doesn't mean they can't do it yesterday or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And do we know if the local, the Johnson, Mazel, Straub, and Murphy mm -hmm. could do the same service provided? Is that what Webb asked? Yes. So they could do the same yes. thing. Okay. For that same price that they quoted. Yes. <laughs> that's... Then what makes the Potter more? Well, again, I think it's just because that they've truly committed a lot of time to this audit and the amount of staff time, which they'll have three staff members on site, one of which will be Bob. Um, again, they have several clients for years that have done CAFRs. Um, I, had, I think I had indicated in my memo that Bob is actually an instructor for the LGC, so it, he's the teacher that teaches our teacher. Um, he's got certificates of achievement for his auditing work, um, and again, I feel like it's just the amount of partner time um, and hours that they've committed to this audit. And the, how experience they have with you know different situations and I think there's a lot to to be said about somebody that has more than just one client that can provide some insight to some unique situations when they've had several different clients of different scopes and sizes and you know um, geographical areas where they so, might have some knowledge of some unique so situations Amy out of the 250 total hours that they mm -hmm. project for this how many of those hours are travel hours to get here and, and hours that they're going to use not per se in the books? They didn't break out the travel time, but the, the tra their travel time is included in their price, but not in the hours. It's just they tacked on additional, that, that's what leads up to the price as part of the travel time. And they would, they've already tried to map it out because I don't think any of the firms wanted to give us, um, you know, a quote if they didn't feel like it could fit into their schedule. So, you know, fitting us into their schedule, I think is possible because of, you know, being able to, dare, to, to do the audit for Dare County. So they are trying to fit us in to make it the most economical, but that being said, there is travel time. So the doubling travel time, both to Dare County and to Nags Head. I'm not sure. <laughs> is this com comparative to what um, Dare County pays? Uh, well, if I may, I did, I did, like I had said, reach out to, to David Clausen because um, I do respect him. I actually have worked with Bob in the past, um, and he pretty much said the same thing is that, um, as I had indicated, Bob's been doing their audit for about 25 years, and, and he said every time they submit an RFP, they always pick them because they're the most qualified, but they're always the most expensive. But I'm not, I'm, you know, having listened, listening to the conversation, um, <clears throat> looking at the, the partner hours, I'm also not, I'm hearing that Potter and Company is the 
highly recommended, most qualified, does a lot of work with Dare County. Um, are there res significant reservations with using um, Johnson Mazelle, for example? N no, again, I just, we staff just basically picked based on their Qualified. experiences and qualifications. And because Potter, in our opinion, <clears throat> was the most qualified being kind of specializing in, in governmental auditing, the amount of clients they have, the years they've been doing it, the single audits, the CAFRs, it, I felt like that brought a lot more to the table. Do we know if, was town manager Lawton contacted with the town of Duck for a reference I, as well? I did not contact him since they weren't my my first recommendation, but but I'd be happy to. Uh, I want to ask the attorney. Um, this is not. We can make a qualifications based decision or a cost based decision. We're not constrained in any way in the purchase of this particular no. service for the town. No, it's it's based on qualifications, but you'd get to decide whose qualifications best meet the town's needs and then negotiate the <clears throat> um, the costs for those services. It's, yeah. it's basically it's professional service, and it's, so it's who we're most comfortable with as a board. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Which does leave you some room to negotiate on how the services will be provided, the scope of those services, and the costs for those. Okay. What are the board's wishes? I just as far as year one, I don't know if I've heard nine thousand dollars more in mm -hmm. qualifications to, to do it. I respect staff's opinion, but at the same time, being able to justify spending that extra money. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. You know, I, 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 I'm not saying anything other than just for informational purposes. But I've been through one audit with Johnson Burgess, and I found them to be highly professional and to provide everything that was needed during the audit process, mm -hmm. and that was with the Tourist Bureau. Mm -hmm. Actually, I say that. It's, I've been through more than one, but I've, I've been on a committee where the committee met with Johnson Burgers. Right. Or Johnson Mazel. Right. Any further questions for Amy? Happy to entertain a, a motion to make a choice between one of these. Amy, in that line underneath partner, that's the partner hours, correct? That's when the partner is going to be on site doing it. That's what was, um, yes, when we kind of made a graph of what was proposed, that's what was in their proposal. And I I believe in their um, the documentation that they had with their qualifications that they had indicated it would be Bob, the partner, a manager, and then a staff person yeah. on site. And just remember, this says senior staff or partner. It doesn't say the percent is not the partner's percent. It's either or. Not that that makes much difference because some senior staff are probably better than partners. <laughs> In some settings, I guess. In some settings. <laughs> Thank you, John. to receive any additional information. I don't know why one's better than the other. Right. Make a motion. For, um... Well, uh, it's for unusual for the mayor to make the motion, but I'll make the motion. Um, uh, I would make a, a motion that the board select uh, Johnson, Mazel, Straub, and Murphy. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. 
Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, the next item on our agenda would be items referred to and presentations from the town attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> other than congratulating the town clerk on her 25th anniversary, I, I have nothing to present. Okay. Thank you. Um, items referred to and presentations from the town manager. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to discuss with the board um, staff's uh, proposed um, plan for an, uh, an additional municipal service district. Um, thank you. The, uh, the town's established a number of benefits in conducting beach nourishment and shoreline management activities. Um, the number one purpose for establishing, no, i number one, the number one in a list of reasons to establish a municipal service district um, is beach erosion control and flood and hurricane protection works. Um, when we, we've done two projects now, we've got, we have, as the board is well aware, we have two municipal service districts um, a north and a south, um, and we've, we've planned for, implemented and paid, pay, now paying for the second project, but those projects have more or less um, been short term. If you can consider what we're trying to do is long term stabilization of the beach. We've done, the first project was determined, um, planned the last 10 years. Um, we got eight before we nursed again, we tried two and seven, but the bids came out for, um, Better for us to do it in eight years. But we need to start looking beyond, and this project that we've done now likely will respond the same way as the first project. But I think we need to start looking long-term and how we're gonna pay for beach, beach nourishment projects and as well as other properties that are benefiting from beach nourishment that may receive a, um, a bigger benefit um, than areas of the town uh, other than those located in the in the uh, present MSDs. Um, I, I think we're looking, we want to look at a 30 year plan. We want to, you know, we know that erosion, we're not stopping erosion, we're, we're trying to slow it down, but it's um, buying time, the, the beach is going to continue to erode. Um, we've got beach accesses that we need to protect that um, service the entire west side for access to the beach. Um, we've got obviously the two streets that need to be um, secured, we've got water lines, we've got power lines. All those things are, are reasons why I think we need to look at expanding um, or adding an additional municipal service district. Um, I'm requesting the board discuss the merits of creating these. Um, primarily what is being proposed are two additional MSDs, one north Weldmone Junction to include all pro properties east of 158 and one south of Wellbone Junction to include all properties in South Nags Head. Um, in your packet, there's a, there's a um, PowerPoint presentation, some slides about MSDs. The board's well aware of all, all the reasons why you create an MSD and going through the process, so I won't belabor those. Um, but I do just wanna add to a few more of the reasons and considerations why we're proposing this. As you know, we're in the process of obtaining perpetual easements for the next projects. Um, our present easements um, expire in 2021, and obviously they're not gonna, we won't have easements for the next round of properties, so that planning is occurring. Um, we're in the process of, we've interviewed engineers and surveyors for the next project. We've, we've um, really tried to focus on not just planning the next project, but planning thir at least 30 years out um, and part of that planning, um, we, we, we know from lessons learned, we, we have to plan better for dune stabilization, sand, sand fencing, uh, beach grass, um, stabilization of those dunes. So our, so our scope is expanding, and so therefore I think the MSDs need to expand as well. Um, and what is um, contemplated in, in the general statutes that, that describe how you can establish MSDs, they, they directly speak to um, the extension of service districts. So I think in the general statutes, they, they recognize that properties, that there are properties that may gain from, from when you initially started um, additional properties down the road that are gaining a benefit from the project. Um, the way we would 
go about doing this, if, if the board's so, so inclined to consider this, there's some steps that we'd have to go through. Um, the town would have to adopt the MSD by an ordinance. A public hearing is required. Um, and prior to, and we would just do this exactly like we did back in 2011 um, with one change. Um, prior to the public hearing, the town must prepare a report to include a map of the districts and the proposed boundaries, a statement identifying the services needed in the district. The statement must detail why the services needed in that district are greater than those needed in other parts of the town, and as well as a plan for providing services in the district. Notice the hearings required stating the date, hour, and place of the hearings and its subject. The notice shall include a map of the district and a statement that the report required for the public hearing is available for public review in the office of the town clerk. You have to publish the notice at least one week prior to the hearing, and everyone in the property boundaries um, receive a direct mailer, uh, direct notice of this. Um, the, the one difference from when we did this in 2011 is that uh, general statute added that owners may request exclusion from the district by submitting a written request to the board no later than five days after the public hearing. And the board may exclude the property after making a finding that it is not in need of the services. Um, you, can, you can direct us, the next step would be, if this is, and this obviously this is you know, before the board for the first time, so there's, I'm sure, a lot of discussion that needs to take place. But if, uh, if this was something the board was interested in doing, we would, you would direct staff to prepare the report that I mentioned, the map, the statement, and the plan. Um, we would bring that back to you March 4th, um, report to the board. We would report to the board the map, statement, and plan again, may, make it available for public inspection. You'd set a public hearing four weeks, uh, or you would notice the public hearing four, in four weeks in advance, do the mailing, you could ha have the public hearing in May. Uh, you have to adopt the ordinance um, by majority on two votes. Uh, so there'd be an additional uh, public hearing, possibly June 3rd. Um, what, what I want to show you is, and when you're con in consideration of, and I'll go straight to this map, um, and what we've got shown here on this map, if we're considering additional MSDs, the present, the present MSD MSDs that we have now, the north area is this red boundary, and that includes all the oceanfront property east of 12, and then south of uh, Wellbone Junction, it includes all the property uh, in, the, in the blue boundary um, south of Nags Head. What we're considering and it, it, or proposing more or less mirrors the, um, the area of ocean influence that the tax department uses when assessing property from, for its proximity to the ocean, the increased value that their property receives from the beach nourishment. And so, so therefore, um, the, the statement would include that these areas that were proposed and receive a greater benefit because of their proximity. And there's, there's two different possibilities here. There's several that you could consider. The green section is areas, are areas um, to the west of Wrightsville in the north end of town. What, what you see on this map is pretty much a straight line, everyone the same proximity to the ocean. Um, when you get up around Jockey's Ridge that starts to, up to Bonnet Street, these properties are a little bit further away and I don't believe they're in the area of ocean influence so they don't receive the uh, increased tax value or the tax um, and now, or, or the property is, isn't high, uh, assessed at a higher rate because of its proximity. Um, and then, of course, in, in South Nag said uh, the statement would be that 1243 is the only access that, um, except for 12 coming up from the north, but the 1243 for all the properties in South Nag said are serviced from that road, um, and protection of that road obviously is extremely important. Um, so, this is a lot to consider at this time, um, but, but my main reason for this is considering the needs down the road. I think the present MSD has served us well and it's, we've been able to manage the two projects off of what we have in place. But looking long, long term, uh, I, it's my opinion that we're going to need to add an additional MSD um, north and south 
uh, so that we can continue to plan for beach nourishment. You, you heard from the county manager last meeting that the, that the fund isn't, he's not anticipating the fund to grow at the rate that, people, that other towns are gonna be looking to take from it. Um, I don't think we can continue to depend on that. I think we'd be short-sighted to, to imagine that that fund is gonna continue to support our projects at 50% of the value. The, the prices are gonna go up. Um, and, and like I said, the, uh, the benefits truly, I think, affect these MSDs. Um, and it's just something I think the board should consider. If, if this is something you wanted, you could put the MSD in place. The, re the requirement is that you would, in order to tax, well actually in order to put it in place, you'd have to let a contract for services in that MSD within a year. Um, that's something that we're contemplating doing now. We're, we're looking at bringing on the next engineer and the next surveyor for the next round of projects. So that's another reason why I'm coming before you because of the timing. Yeah. Um, and so the, the last thing I'll just add again to this statement, why um, the, the sur I, I went through and I listed, the statement may include these seven things and maybe more. Erosion continues, even though Beach Nourishment is buying us time, the erosion continues. Uh, the third thing on this list of reasons why you can create an MSD um, are drainage projects. Um, we're, if we're in court, if we're looking long term and in incorporating, um, we can incorporate drainage projects for this area. If you think about some of the projects that we've contemplated that directly affect these areas of town, that could be added to the statement as a benefit. Hurricane protection, protection of beach accesses, which serves all of us. Um, property protection, long-term planning, as I mentioned, with additional fencing, plantings, grass, and managing the dunes, as well as the street access are all things that you may have others, that, but that I would include in the statement of benefit. Um, I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Uh, I have a, a question um, about the configuration of the districts and the inclusion of drainage. So project has to be in the district and it has to reasonably encompass the district. So uh, as an example, if, if we had had drainage as a possibility in the previous language, then when we did Seven Sisters, Red Drum, and wanted to do a project in Old Nags Head Place for drainage, they're all in the northern, well, no, they're not, <laughs> but that they could be in terms of the way you drew the boundary, <clears throat> you could have used those funds legitimately for drainage. So I'm looking at particular at the north end up here where the green sort of alternate area is because that's, I think what you were saying was that's questionable in terms of whether that's ocean influence there. Correct. But it's potentially a drainage, an area where drainage is an issue can that, could that district, could we have a district that overlapped the other, that where the green is, that went to the ocean and came to one, but that was a, that was an overlapping district? It, the, the, the yellow in between right. would encompass the ocean. That would be an MSD. And I, if I hear what you're saying right, then a third one would go from the green to the ocean park. Correct, yes. yes. You can do that. Yes, you can do that. Sure. Okay. That, I mean, that might be, that might be useful. I just raise that. Just a, a follow-up follow question is, also, why didn't we take a proposed MSD all the way to the town line with Kill Devil Hills? Well, I think we could, we c the main reason is we don't have a project. When you get north of Bonnet Street, if, if, if that was your question, if you get north of Bonnet Street, there's no project to assess a tax for. And if you create the MSD now, and you know we're, we're actually getting, trying to secure perpetual easements for people that aren't in the project area in the north section of town, assuming one day we're, we may um, extend our project to that area. But if, if we were to do that at the same time, say they take effect July 1st, we'd have to let a contract for that section of town. And right now we don't have that in place. Now we could, we could put in the scope of service with the next engineer that they can 
incorporate the planning um, of that section of town into their, their scope of service, but that's why. Okay. But if you're looking on a 30 year plan, wouldn't you consider the town, not just a section that we currently are just expanding? There's gonna be future water uh, drainage needs as we just went through last year in those same areas. I, I think you could make an additional MSD. I, I, I don't know that I'd recommend you extend those MSDs, um, but I think that's something we could consider. That's something, because the, the, the argument I'm making is that the sections that I've identified are, are benefited from beach nourishment from the planning. If nothing else, they're being considered in the plan which is the same thing I think you're saying for the north end of town. But I, I, it's just problematic in, t in. So we could create the MSD today that would basically be from Wrightsville to the ocean, let's say, on the north, you know, what's not colored in here, the only part of the town, that side that's not, and not tax it. No, I, the attorney will have to step in here. If you create an MSD, you, you you have to let a contract within a year. Within a year of when the um, district became effective, and it becomes effective on um, the beginning of the fiscal year after it was adopted. So that you do have that window of time during which you need to go ahead and let the service, pr provide the services, whatever those might be, which, might, which would include letting a contract for the design of the services. I, but I think we could create that MSD and put a nominal amount for the planning to incorporate the north end of town into the planning process. Mm -hmm. So today you're asking us to prepare if the board wants to direct you to prepare the report, if, correct? If, if, correct. If, if this is something the board would like for staff to pursue and consider, then um, we would come back to you in March with all the required things listed there, the map, the statement, and the plan for letting services. And then you could decide if you wanted to continue. You, you, may, you may take that and decide not to continue, but that's the first step in the process. I make the motion that we direct the, the uh, staff to prepare the report, but also to include the north end of Ocean Influence area. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Um, that move it. Five. <laughs> That would be the March 4th meeting, correct? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Um, the other item, I, there's three different parts to this, and I'm going to combine the first two when it comes to uh, sanitation and recycling services for the town. Um, of course, as the board is well aware, presently we're not recycling. Um, we were made aware by Outer Banks Holland um, January 7th that due to the fact that where they were hauling our material, Tidewater fi Fiber, they were no longer accepting third-party uh, material. Um, that that left a few options for Outer Banks Holland to continue with. Um, we could continue, uh, well, actually we could start doing what we're doing now and divert the materials to Willebrader and Portsmouth for it to be incinerated for reuse, waste energy reuse. Um, we, could, we could have continued to take it to Tide Water Fiber. Um, they would have accepted it at a higher rate, I believe $135. However, there was no guarantee that it, it likely it would not be recycled it, you know, until they found a buyer. So it would, that didn't seem to be a viable option because of the cost. And then third option was there's a facility that our bank Holland has in Manassas that it could be hauled to, but we would be looking at about $175 a ton. Presently, we're paying Outer Banks Holland $70 a ton to take this material. Um, so those options just didn't seem um, viable or realistic. Um, so what, we're here before you today. One, one of the things, they have some options. Um, 
one of the things you, you could potentially do is amend the contract or, or give written a written permission for Outer Banks Holland to divert our material. The contract reads now that uh, only 10% of the recycling material that they pick up can be diverted to a landfill or to an incinerator um, without the express written permission from the town. So one thing to do would be to, to give them that permission forever, how long you deemed it necessary. Um, there's two other kind of working parts that there's multiple working parts to this, but uh, as the board's aware, we have an agreement with the Albemarle Solid Waste Management Authority that requires all of our solid waste to be carried to them and to their facility. Um, we were able to divert this recycling because obviously it's, it's not solid waste, it's recyclable use and, and, and the, the agreement allowed for that. Um, and then there was the question about whether or not DEQ um, would allow this material to be incinerated because it's not technically recycling. It, it's reuse and it's waste energy, however, it's not recycling. Um, and so I've gotten, uh, we've received a letter from DEQ that, that on dated January 15th that they understood the situation we were in and that they were granting us permission to divert this and they would re-examine that decision in three months. So if you were inclined to, to get permission to, for this to be incinerated, my recommendation would be you would do it for those three months. Um, actually, I think you would, I, my recommendation would be that uh, you would, you would um, go to the end of April. So when you come back, so we had a meeting in March, you could reevaluate then um, based on whether or not anything's changed. Um, DEQ has notified us that they, although I don't know who and I don't know how, um, that there's a, a potential, excuse me, vendor that they're interested in putting a facility somewhere in northeastern North Carolina. I've got a lot of questions about that. Um, I, I believe that they believe that that's a possibility, um, but the, the market being what it is, it's just hard to see that as a realistic um, option. But, but nevertheless, they've asked for us to let them run that course and, and try to determine whether or not that truly is a viable option. That also takes a lot of time. I, I, I don't foresee, even if uh, it were to happen, it would be a considerable amount of time from now um, before that ever came to, to be. Um, so you have the option, you could discontinue. You could stop this process altogether. Um, the, the contract's written that you, you could end this contract 30 days notice and under the circumstances, I think, um, you could do it sooner than that. Um, you could go back to voluntary subscription program. Um, some of the other communities in Dare County do that. Uh, we, when we, in, um, when in, I believe it was 2012, when we switched from, at, at that time we were doing a voluntary subscription <coughs> program, um, we had about 483 households that were recycling. Um, but at that time, around that time, we went to a pilot program where we started picking up on the beach road. And then soon after that, we just rolled it into the taxes and we, and we picked it up town-wide. Um, you could amend your present, and this kind of ties into the second decision. The, the first, I think, is the most time, the, one of the biggest time concerns because we are in violation of the contract right now. Um, We're not in violation, they're in violation. Well, they're in violation. We're in a contract that the other parties and not by um, upholding. Um, you could, you could, um, in a response to this, you could get about 380. To, the, the contract split up into two periods of time. Because of the demand in the summer months, we contract with Outer Banks Holland at $195,000 to pick up the beach road Monday and Friday um, every week, and that's from. Um, May to September. In the, in the other seven months, we're able to pick up both with our forces. We pick up about 380 tons during that seven months. Um, is that enough? To con and is that enough, um, especially when you're not recycling? I mean, it, it's, it's $7 less a ton, but we could, we could combine those two services. We could pick up trash and recyc recycling at the same time. Uh, and reduce down to one day a week town-wide. Um, that would give staff time to do other things. So that's an option. Um, 
if you do that, then, you know, there's some question as to whether or not, um, you know, the disruption in those seven months, um, whether or not people will, they'll get used to recycling and they got, then they're not recycling and they go back to recycling. But it is, it is an option in response that we could, um, that we could address this issue with. So what, what I'm asking really is that the board, if the board's inclined to continue allowing Will, um, Outer Banks Holland to take the material to Willibrator, we need to either grant permission um, or amend the contract. Um, that's the first thing. And then the second is your And you may not, if the second may keep you from doing the first. If you decide any of these other options, um, I, th I think it's difficult to have this discussion to make a decision without discussing both at the same time. Uh, Joshua Smoltz from Outer Banks Holland is here in the audience. He's been here since the beginning. He's, I didn't know he was gonna be here. I think he's just here out of interest. I, I will say Outer Banks Holland has been an excellent partner with the town. Um, that they've tried to work with us through this process. You know, the, the changing condition is not their doing. They're, they're kind of caught in the process as everyone else. Um, it, again, it's too early to determine um, what this maybe plant in eastern North Carolina would be, but Outer Banks Holland would carry our material there. How much? I don't know. It would be more. The tipping fee would be more. The tipping fee would be less. I, I don't know that. Um, what I didn't mention was about Willibrator, um, their company. I've got their, um, their permit that they offer here um, that describes how they operate, how their facility is um, manned and operated and regulated. Uh, they're in compliance with their permit. Uh, they, they sort this material for things that can't be incinerated. They take out the ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Everything else is um, converted to energy that is put back into the grid. The Navy uses, they supply the Navy with some energy. It's not exclusively for the, for the Navy, but um, it's turned into to reuse. Um, they're, they're a worldwide company. Um, so again, I'll stop here. Wow. I can make a couple of observations. I had, um, I've had one conversation with, uh, I've had a couple of conversations with the commissioner from Kittleville Hills and one conversation with yesterday with a commissioner from Southern Shores who called and they're all trying to find their way uh, through this as well um, and concerned about, you know, what's the, what's the ultimate outcome. Um, and then on short notice uh, yesterday afternoon, I attended the Outer Banks Restaurant Association um, monthly meeting and they had invited officials from all of the towns and the county in part just to have more interaction, but recycling was on their agenda. Um, if you have an ABC license, you're obligated to some degree of recycling. And so they're concerned about what form the programs begin to take and are also talking among themselves about initiatives that um, would make them a little more sustainable. Uh, there was a conversation even uh, about them grinding glass on site um, in some cases that, that small units are available. So everybody's trying to figure out a way, a way through this. <clears throat> um, you know, my, the, the, the thing that sort of gets me is that the, the biggest problem is it's the program's not what we've always said it was. And it's not full recycling. You know, it's not recycling, it's partial recycling. You know, I, if, if, if we had been talking for the last 15 or 20 years about a waste diversion program that was maybe recycling, maybe incineration for energy, and that's always what it was, then that's what it would be. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be in this boat. And some of the other issues, the concerns that we've had over the years about contamination or whatever would go away because it's all, it's all either being recycling, recycled or being burned, but it's being used in a constructive way and it's diverted from the landfill. So, um, you know, whether that's part of an ultimate solution or not, I'm, I'm glad DEQ is working on this. There seems to be a sense that people would like to work together to find a solution, but uh, I'm glad DEQ is taking the, the lead 
Um, I think there needs to be some conversation, and Commissioner Cahoon has agreed to speak with DEQ about, you know, sort of where this lies and their overall priorities and who's working on this and, and, and whatnot. So um, all that all that is to say, you know, I think this is going to take some time, and I hope I hope we'll find a way to give it some time, you know, as we work through the contract issue to try to figure out what we're, what we're all doing and what kind of program we're going to end up with um, and whether it's anything that's any better than what we've had um, or, or not. Um, so I'll, and I'll stop there. Um, Mayor, we had this discussion at our retreat um, a couple weeks ago, and the consensus, I believe, was to continue with the May through September mm -hmm. um, program with out of banks hauling at the current rate, which is a contracted price. We just need to amend that contract to make that happen. The other thing was talked about um, was combining our garbage and recycling in the off season. Um, while we wait for something from DQ, I'm prepared to let's move on currently as we do it until the, we get into budget talks and we start talking about what happens after July 1st. And hopefully we'll have some better resolution. Cliff, I know that we have a contract through Dare County with the landfill. Is there any possible mechanism that during the months of October through April since we do both pick up of recycling and pick up of garbage, how much of a violation would be if we sent all of that to be converted to energy? Um, if, if you mean the trash? Yeah. Um, they take solid. Yeah, but the, they can't take our solid. Can we amend our contract in any way? To, so just during the off season, not during the peak season when we have so much garbage, but. If we're going to possibly combine those two things, mm -hmm. could we, in the interest of reducing our carbon footprint and converting it to energy, is there any leeway? And I know you can't really answer that. Well, but can we start those discussions? I think I, yeah, Dare County would have to. Somebody's got to haul it. You can. Which we do. Well, I mean, for us to haul a ton, to, for us to take our truck, our, our trucks. Portsmouth is a haul, um, and I don't think we're equipped to do that. But we we may, we may be able. To, I guess that's the that it might be involved in the other towns. Exactly, and Outer Banks Hall. Yeah, because it, you know, and also there was a lot of discussion yesterday about getting glass out of this stream, if at all possible. Um, yeah, because ABC takes glass out, but right now nobody's taking glass. If we could convert all of our glass, which would reduce our footprint as well as our tipping fees, yeah. and convert that into crushing and so forth, would help a lot. Yeah, I mean there was. If we could take our glass to, Dare County would take the glass and crush it and use it. But you have however. to get it. But you have to get you it, have to get separate it. it, and carry it. Well, I, you know, I was told yesterday, and I'm, yeah, this again, this is. There are units available, restaurant scale units that are available for as little as six hundred dollars or so that'll take your glass and turn it into sand. I mean, basically, you know, I mean, they had an example of it yesterday. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pure sand. I've seen those. Um, Beach nourishment. Know. Beach nourishment. That, that, was, that was actually, that was, that was the joke. But, but, but you, you know, is that potential at a town scale? Is that, is that everybody's glass gets picked up and, you know, with a, with, you know, do we all sign up with the same vendor? I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, um, I think it will take us until the end of summer to figure it out. If we can figure it out by then. And we need to figure it out by then. Whatever, whatever it is. We need to make some hard decisions by the end of the summer. Yes, we one do. One way or another. Yes, we do. Yeah, I we mean, do. and we actually need to make it probably by more at July 1st. Yeah, that's budget. true. That's true. And that would, I'm questioning whether. You know, if if DEQ is serious about driving that bus, can they do that by July the first? Well, <laughs> hopefully we'll have some conversations that will give us some idea. 
It, there are, you know, we have drop. We have two drop-off sites in town, which could continue to. You know, we could hopefully, if, if we weren't, if we were to make a change and not continue the contract, that those sites would still be available and, and be a, hopefully Outer Banks Holland could carry those for those that did want to recycle. I'm thinking, I'm looking down the road. I, there's a lot of questions yet to be answered. And our current contract with Outer Banks Holland goes until the end of the fiscal year or? February of 2022. It's a three year contract that we're just now getting into the second year of. Recognizing that we can get out of it any time. Right. Right. Due to the violation. Due to the fact that we're not going to get out of it regardless. There's a 30 day yeah, notice yeah. to cancel yeah. period for either party. That's right. But I would say that we would continue on having our recyclables taken <clears throat> to the now to give time for DEQ to work. We're not tacking ourselves on any more time. We can yes, still sir. get out of it any time. Yes, sir. If, if I may, Mr. Mayor, um, of the I think the policy uh, issues y'all are discussing are, are really for the board to, to consider, but there's a legal issue I just wanted to, to weigh in on. Uh, the manager has provided two separate options um, that I think accomp may seem to accomplish the same thing as between uh, basically um, giving permission to um, uh, bay disposal uh, to not be uh, recycling for a period of time or to amend the contract. As between those two options, I like the first one better because you have, if you grant permission, you can also withdraw that permission. Whereas if you amend the contract, that requires their agreement. And then if you want to change that amendment later on, you have to either get their agreement or just terminate. So I think you, the town has more control if you accept the first option, which is to um, just grant permission for some period of time for the, um, uh, for 100% of the materials to be incinerated. Mm -hmm. Mayor, I, I know we're in discussion, but I'm going to put a motion on the floor for the sake of Be okay. Before you do, may I comment? Yes. Yeah. Just yeah. briefly. Yeah. Um, and I apologize. But That's all right. Before, um, That's all right. I guess the, the first thing is um, I provided everybody a copy of uh, an uh, article that was in the Virginia Pilot today mm -hmm. that I think is very pertinent and I wish everybody would take the time to read it before we come to a decision. Um, what it shows is basically Chesapeake is the only town in the Tidewater area that does curbside recycling. Everybody else, excuse me, that does it within their tax structure. Some people might might do it outside a tax structure. But regardless, I, I, it's, it's a very good article. Um, second of all, my main value is to make sure that the public is fully informed about the position we're in and are we recycling, recycling or not. Third, my next question is, do we leave a bigger carbon footprint by doing something that we don't have an analysis on yet? To wit, moving it from here to somewhere and then into an incinerator may, I don't know because nobody's giving me that information yet, but that may leave a bigger carbon footprint than recycling it. So I don't want to go that way unless I know what the answer is. So I can just tell you I agree with um, Renee Commissioner Cahoon when she said what we decided at the retreat, but I personally think the best thing to do is just suspend recycling until we know um, more information. I mean, when I say if, we, if we're allowed to do that with our contractual arrangement with Bay, and then we're not in a contractual issue with the regional authority because you know we fit both contracts if we just suspend it until we can come up to some conclusion um, I, I really don't want us to spend our money with the false representation that we're recycling a product so that's my personal value I have to agree I did agree with what we decided in the retreat, which Commissioner Hoon presented, but I'm just letting you know my personal value is just to suspend operation until such time as we know what we can or cannot do. You, you raised one, the issue that I've also wondered about is 
covered footprint in whichever direction that we that we go. Um, and and it would be nice, you, you know, we've probably all tried to figure this out a little bit by by Google, and it would be nice to have an authority, um, you know, Coastal Studies Institute, somebody in, who could give us an author somewhat authoritative answer about uh, which carbon footprint was larger or smaller. Right. Um, That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, I, and I would, Great. I'd like to know that. I'd like to know that answer a, a, as well. Um, you, you know, I don't. <clears throat> It was interesting. One of the reasons I went, one of the reasons I pulled the old um, landfill study off the shelf was, well, it was just there in front of me, and so I pulled it off. I thought, wow. It was interesting the degree to which they talked early in the, about diverting waste out of the landfill for obvious reasons. I mean, you, know, you try not to fill up your landfill and then have to take care of that capped. Uh, material for some period of time and the longer you can extend the landfill the better and it's curious to me that they didn't actually pers resolve when they got to the to the pulling the trigger that they did not have a system in place to divert that waste um, so uh, but yes I think more more answers are needed unfortunately I, I have no reservations about telling the town yeah, you know, we're not recycling. Something's being recycled. We think a lot of it's being burned. That's what's happening to your material. Um, and I think when this first came out at our January meeting, when the manager told us, the town immediately put out a press release. And I think getting ahead of it like that certainly gave our citizens knowledge of it. But I will tell you, those that I've talked to and asked really haven't heard about it. Right. I, I, and that's the point. Yeah. I think you know, even what we're saying, even those people that are that are passionate, I don't think they know what we know in terms of what's going on. Well, I think some of the emails have shown that when it talks about recycling. We are not recycling. Mm -hmm. We are diverting, but we're not recycling. Correct. And I think we all agree that we need to have a whole lot more information than what we have today in order to make the best informed decision as we move forward in the upcoming fiscal year. <coughs> Commissioner Fuller, where I'm on the same page as you are as being transparent and open with the public in terms of what we're doing, where you and I differ is for the couple of months that remain until May, I would continue what we were continue what we were doing. But that's again, that's me. And, and my, my basic point is if you stop it, then they know what's going on. That's true. If you don't stop it, then there's an assumption that maybe we are doing something. Uh -huh. Okay. Then you were on the verge of making a motion earlier, and you still look <laughs> that mind. I am. Um, I think we're all in pretty much agreement as to transparency and trying to do something as we move forward. But I'm going to make a motion that we continue right now with bay disposal with the following permission given to for them to divert the trash the trash at least through this fiscal year uh, i'll make another motion later in the future as we move forward but that that's my motion to go until um july 1st okay. or june 30th okay um is there a second i'll second that okay i have a motion and second further discussion on that All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Renee? The only other thing that doesn't require a motion, I don't believe it would be that um, until such time as we get more information that we don't change our schedule um, before the end of this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. If we do something, it would be after the, at the conclusion of the budget as we go into the next fiscal year. That's um, just my, that's my thought process, well, not everybody agree. else's. Uh, um, with, and with um, aggressive pursuit of information and options, because um, that window is going to close really yes, fast. It is. Really fast.
since that's a non-action, does that need a motion? Unless somebody wants to okay. make a change to it. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then the last item I had uh, is the consideration of the ordinance to rescind um, town code section 30-6, which is the storage and removal of trash and recycling carts. I I'd like to ask the board to give me, I'm not prepared as well as I would like to be. I'd like to ask the board to allow me to come back in March. Um, I I've spoken with the village, uh, I believe uh, village property um, homeowners president. Um, I, I believe there's other interested parties um, like Mr. Uh, Masters out here. Um, I, I'd like to have more time to meet um, and share the thought process behind this and get information from, from them and maybe hold, uh, and, and there's more. It's not just the Cove and the village. There's other parts of town that are gonna be affected by this. Um, I, I, I rushed this, it shouldn't be on the agenda at this time and I requested the board let me bring it back in March. Thank you. And that's all I have. Thank you. Um, order, next item on our agenda is the Board of Commissioners agenda. I'll start down at the left. Commissioner Sears? Nothing. Commissioner Cahoon? Just a comment on the item earlier with, from the workforce housing. Um, I don't know if it's new at this time, particular time of year, but, and I appreciate all the work the staff did. Um, planning staff did an awful lot of work and I'm very appreciative of it. Um, but as we move forward, I'd like us to be very cognizant of how we expend taxpayer money and the work product we get from it. Mm -hmm. um, I hope we didn't spend a lot with our consultant on this particular segment of uh, this, because I hope this was more the informal part of it. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I'm just very cognizant that I was not quite satisfied with that particular part of the study. And before we extend any further money, I'd like to have a better definition of the scope of work and what we're going to be paying for. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Mr. Brinkley. I want to thank uh, Ms. Walters and Ms. Payne for speaking on the recycling issue. I certainly appreciate it hearing from them. <clears throat> and then our other person that spoke, Al Friedman, brought up about Special Olympics um, and raising money. Years ago, there used to be a polar plunge here, and I, I don't know what happened to it. And not that it needs to be a town thing, but if he asked us about it, is there any way that we could just maybe reach out to see if there's an... I, while he was talking, I emailed him and asked him, what okay. about the Y? Because I think the Y used to do one, and then there was one for cystic fibrosis, um, and I couldn't find, at lunch, I was trying to figure out where one is. I think there is one, um, but if there's not, then you know, maybe we could put him in the right contact with people that have done right. this in the past. You're right, I mean, I'll, I'll follow up with them. And we've emailed some. Sounds good, thank I you. I was hoping he would challenge you all, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that, I can tell you today. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Mr. Fuller. Um, just one thing real quick, and it goes back to the site plan for the hospital. Um, it was brought to our attention that um, La Fagata's renting spaces and I would just want to make sure that, you know, it was put at us. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just a staff issue, I don't think, because it was thrown at us. I, w I would just want to make sure that the staff follows up and validates that La Fagata has appropriate parking and that we get some sort of feedback on that as soon as possible. It shouldn't take more than 30 minutes to find that out. But I, th I think. I think we need to find that out as quickly as possible. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, next item on our agenda is the mayor's agenda. Uh, you have before you dates for the CIP for the workshops, for the budget workshops. Um, March 25th and if necessary, continuing to April 8th. Have the manager's recommended budget May the 6th, workshop on the 13th, continue to the 27th if necessary, public hearing June the 3rd, budget workshop June the 10th, adoption of the budget at a mid-month meeting on June the 17th. 
Mr. Mayor, I'm unavailable on March the 25th, something that I had planned and had money invested in. Okay. And I'm not, unfortunately, uh, able to change, but. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you. Fortunately, this process does have several steps, okay. so it's, uh, if you miss one of those, it's not, it's not too bad. May I say something not about dates, but about, like, we have, what, one CIP workshop? Yes. Um, it's the issue that's sort of ongoing with the Tourist Bureau looking at a, a 2021 boardwalk expansion and whether the town wants to participate in that. And so I don't know if we've got that on our radar other than at a very low level. And if there's any way that if the board wants to elevate it, you know, that discussion, I, I would certainly encourage that. Yeah. I uh, Lee Nettles, the executive director, reached out to me to, to put it on, you know, officially say, hey, we're, the Tourist Bureau is looking at this. It makes sense for us to plan this together because obviously we've been down this road. We started down this path of a, a boardwalk before. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because, it, you know, it, it would be good to, to have those discussions after the board has decided whether or not it's something we want to push. And I don't know if this is soon noticed. enough. Are these dates soon enough? But I would, they're tight dates to me. Yeah, I mean, that's still a month, a month and a half away before you would discuss it at a capital improvement. So okay. I, I don't know if we need to put this on a, an agenda ahead of time. Um, could we put, I mean, if, it, if something comes to fruition, can we just put it on a meeting agenda as a, CIP topic of discussion before we get to the CIP workshop if there's something fruitful for us to to have in front of us I mean maybe it's a CIP item ahead of I mean without deferring it to the workshop okay. um, just to make you aware too that Wednesday April 8th I will not be here that's coastal resources okay. so I'll be out in April for that particular two days Eight and nine. But otherwise, I'm good. I think. Okay. Um, uh, we got this on the agenda, and I got ahead of myself, as Cliff said, with his with the rollback item. Um, I. I was excited by our discussion, um, this, this visioning exercise that we did at the retreat where we had the bubbles and we talked about this really great vision that we were all in agreement on for Nags Head and uh, I didn't want to lose it. And so I'm, I am trying to take that because be the leader is not an actionable thing. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a goal. But I'm trying to figure out a way that we can have something in front of us that we can build on and create some kind of somewhat actionable list of things that we would like to direct staff. And so I'd like maybe to defer that to another meeting um, as, I, as I work on it. But I'm, I got enough written down that I won't lose it um, and I have a sense of something that I can bring you. Could that be a, as part of that? process so that when none of us lose it be an ongoing item on the agenda that's a great idea mm -hmm. that is a great idea care if you will put that under the mayor's for perpetually <laughs> I think that's a great idea that way none of us forget it and we all participate yeah. and try to move us forward yes thank you um, uh, it passed unobserved but we voted to tear down one of my buildings this morning I, I did the old uh, urgent care center <laughs> at some point in the past. It's interesting when you've been around long enough that Absolutely. you start tearing down the buildings that you <laughs> put up that you got here. It has nothing to do with the they, design. They, that's right. They <laughs> outlive their useful life. Um, actually, not the first time it's happened at Nags Head that I know of, not the first time it's happened. Um, and just to share with the board, um, and I need to, to make Commissioner Sears aware of this, um, I will be away uh, tomorrow and Friday. Um, my wife and I are going with a group of Presbyterians to, to um, uh, 
Montgomery, Alabama to visit the um, Memorial for Peace and Justice. Um, and I expect that to be a, a pretty great experience. It's otherwise euphemistically known as the Lynching Museum, but it's, um, look forward to that being a, an interesting experience. Um, and then next week, there's a 90% chance that um, I'll go to be going to Puerto Rico to inspect uh, earthquake damage buildings. And so uh, emergency management is putting together a team and I'm on that list and they've sent one team and they're considering they're now trying to put together another team to send down there um, for, for a week. Um, they want more, but I can't give them more. So um, they may not take me if I, if I can only give them eight days, but we'll see. Um, so that's it for me. So I will be, you have the keys to the town. <laughs> Don't crash it. Now's the time to make the changes, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, is there any other business to come before the board? Hearing none, the next item on our agenda is adjournment. Recess. I'm sorry, thank you. God knows. <laughs> I need a, and it's on it's in red letters on my it's in red letters on my agenda. Um, we need to reset a motion would be in order to recess to the Tuesday, February eighth, uh, joint workshop with the planning board at nine AM and uh, to a Tuesday, February eighteenth, same day, one PM. Board of Commissioners mid-month meeting. Make a motion to that. Yeah. Second. Um, second. 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 All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you.